Naruto's relationship with Jiraiya is more than mentor and student. It's like father and son. The legendary Sanin each mentored one member of Team 7. Jiraiya had Naruto, Orochimaru had Sasuke, and Tsunade had Sakura. But I can't help but wonder what it could have been like for each to train under all three at the same time, particularly Naruto. How could this have changed things? I suppose there's only one way to figure this out, so let's get into it. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. We've noticed that a lot of people who are watching these videos aren't subscribed to the channel, and you know what, you might think that you are subscribed considering how YouTube's algorithm works, but if you do subscribe to us, it really helps our channel and lets us make even more awesome videos like this. The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider Consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. Jiraiya sat alone at a bar in Konoha. He let out a sigh as he took his headband off. Ever since Minato had died, things had gotten tougher. Hiruzen was back in power, and the process of rebuilding Konoha was starting to take a toll on everyone. Not just physically rebuilding the village, because that had ended years ago. It was rebuilding their reputation that they were doing now. Konoha was full of powerful shinobi, this was true, but the near destruction of their way of life was enough to cause any nation watching to reconsider the way they perceived Konoha. A single man with a tailed beast walked in and decimated the village. That did the one thing to Konoha that the tailed beast's rampage alone could not do. It made them look weak, and this weakness caused those who sought opportunity to crop up and attempt the move against the village, hoping to profit from its destruction. But Jiraiya was here. Having been called back into service like this had been a shock to his system. He'd grown accustomed to his role as an undercover spy, searching for leads into this man who had harmed the leaf. But it seemed that what Konoha needed now the most was someone to take on missions that displayed dominance, not one seeking a single man. Too much energy wasted. Jiraiya believed in his heart that bringing this man to justice would be able to restore some of their name, but Hiruzen's orders were absolute. And so, here he was, back in Konoha, working as he had during the Second Shinobi World War. At about that time, the door opened with the chime of a bell as a man stepped in. Jiraiya peeked around the side, looking past the many people standing in the way. He'd wave out, Orochimaru! Orochimaru, over here! The old snake would walk over and sit down by him. Quick note for the viewers, I'm changing Orochimaru just a little. He's going to be a little calmer, a little less evil. I'm going to add to him a conscience, something he seemed to lack in the original story. While he is still a scientist, he possesses some moral standards, meaning that he isn't killing anyone in his research. This also means that he isn't driven out of the village. Back to the story. He would sit down next to Jiraiya. You called? Jiraiya nodded. Yeah. Orochimaru looked over. What's the issue? Jiraiya shook his head as he poured Orochimaru a glass of sake. Nothing's the issue, I just wanted to spend a little time with my old team. I need to relax. Orochimaru looked around. Where's Tsunade then? I assumed you would have invited her. Jiraiya laughed. I did. She's in the bathroom. She beat both of us here. They looked back to see Tsunade stumbling out of the bathroom. She leaned against the wall and hiccuped, her face a bright red as her eyes indicated that she'd been drinking long before either of them had arrived. Another slight change. Tsunade doesn't leave the village here. She decides to stay for her love of the village. She stumbles into the bar and sits down. She takes a bottle and pours a little sake into a shot glass before pushing the shot glass aside. Save some for later. She turned the bottle up and chugged it until it was dry. She let it aside and a partially hidden burp. Tsunade then looked to him with half-closed eyes. So why did <laughs> you call us here? Jiraiya laughed. Why can't we just relax? Tsunade shook her head. You've got something up your sleeve. You only ever ask us out when you've got something to say, she said. I've known you long enough to know how you are. Well, if you have something <laughs> to say, then say it now before the sake kicks in. Jiraiya looked down. You guys remember when I trained with the Toad Sages? Tsunade nodded. Orochimaru sat forward, both elbows on the bar as he took a sip from his glass. He knew Jiraiya had been hiding his motivations. Yeah, I recall it. It was what spurred me to go searching for a sage of my very own to learn from. Jiraiya continued. Well, the toad sage I trained under had a vision. Orochimaru looked at Jiraiya with curiosity, not speaking as he did not want to interrupt. Jiraiya continued. In the vision, he said I would one day train the child of destiny. The child would go on to bring peace to the world. I don't know if it'll be any of the kids I've already trained or will train. Tsunade gave a hiccup as she shot back the sake in the shot glass. We definitely know it won't be Minato, because he's dead. Orochimaru looked away as he knew this was a sensitive subject for Jiraiya, as Jiraiya had been Minato's mentor. Jiraiya ignored the statement and continued. I don't know if I've trained them yet. 
but I do know one thing. I want to keep training Shinobi. If I have yet to train the Child of Prophecy, when I eventually do, I want to offer him every tool to get prepared with. I want you two to join me in training them. I'm certain that together we can make them even stronger. Orochimaru let out a long, droning sound as he thought about it skeptically. I don't know. I'm more of a scientist at heart. I'm not really cut out to be anyone's mentor. Jiraiya scoffed at this. You already had a team, Orochimaru. Yeah, and they never really amounted to anything. Oh, come on. Anko Mitarashi is a skilled girl. Orochimaru thought about it. I'll give her credit, but she still isn't much more than just some other shinobi. Jiraiya continued. Well, what about that Kabuto boy? Aren't you mentoring him? Only in the academic arts, Jiraiya. I'm not teaching him how to be a ninja. I'm teaching him how to be a scientist. Jiraiya shrugged. Same difference. You're mentoring someone, and that's what matters. So what is it to add a few kernels of wisdom to the next generation? I'm not asking you to give up your studies, nor am I demanding that you take on students of your own. I'm merely asking that as I train them, when I send them your way, you'll do me a solid and give them some pointers. Orochimaru nodded. Fine, I can do that. Jiraiya looked back at Tsunade. What do you think about it? Are you willing to try? Tsunade held up her finger. I have a question. What is it? Jiraiya asked. Her eyes rolled up and she fell off the stool onto the floor. Jiraiya looked down. I guess that question has to come later. Jiraiya stood and threw her over his shoulder. I suppose I should get her home. I'm just glad that you'll be willing to help me, Orochimaru. I don't know who this child of prophecy is, but with the way of the shinobi world, they'll need all the help they can get. A boy in an orange jumpsuit stepped into the light of the rising sun. His right foot resting on a box like Captain Morgan or something, he gazed out over the village with a look of excitement. Enter Naruto Uzumaki, the most hated and gutsy ninja in the village. Fresh out of the academy, he was here to show the world that he didn't give a rat's ass about what they said. He would become Hokage and be renowned as a respectable person, someone that everyone would have no choice but to acknowledge. Look out world, cause here I come. He jumped down from his perch on the side of his apartment building, dropping to the ground. He rushed off as he zipped his orange jacket and tied his headband around his head, the marked forehead protector serving as a spiteful symbol of his own worth to any of the villagers who would so often gaze at him with contempt. Now they merely avoided looking at him in general. Those who did look at him would do so out of the corner of their eye. Naruto would look at these people and pull his left bottom eyelid down and stick out his tongue. Neener, neener, neener. On most days, he was a bit more respectful, but he really wanted to rub it in their faces now. Regardless of what they said or did, he was now an official ninja and one step closer to becoming Hokage. So who cared what they thought at this moment? They'd eventually have to respect him. He rushed into the academy where he would be assigned to Team 7. This consisted of Sakura, who Naruto was ecstatic about being on a team with, and Sasuke, who Naruto was less than thrilled to team up with. Iriko would tell them where to go to meet their Joni and Kakashi, and they'd head there. The start to their relationship with Kakashi seemed rocky at best, as he tested their teamwork and had them doing chores as opposed to missions. But when Naruto's voice cried out for a real challenge, Hiruzen offered them the Tazuna escort mission, which Naruto accepted with vigor and excitement. Jiraiya was merely walking down the street when he suddenly saw Naruto and his team run by. He turned for a moment as they passed and looked back. Minato! He watched the little blonde boy run off beside his team. Jiraiya felt a strange sense of nostalgia from looking at the boy. Something in him reminded him of his time with Minato. He continued to walk on, looking back only once to see that same bright smile that he had taught years ago reflected in another face, and he began to wonder, could it be? He was currently making his way to the Hokage's office, only stopping once to greet Orochimaru who just so happened to be going in the same direction. The old man summoned you too? Jiraiya asked. Orochimaru scoffed. We can hardly call him that anymore, Jiraiya. We're getting old too. Jiraiya looked over as they continued on their path. You seem far less hostile towards that fact than you used to. Orochimaru pondered it for a time. When I was younger, I was terrified of dying. Yet you decided to become a shinobi, Jiraiya interposed. Orochimaru continued. I didn't become a shinobi to fight. I became a shinobi to learn all of the secrets that this life has to offer. This is a big world filled with the mystery of jutsu. Who wouldn't want to study it? But back in the original point, I was scared of dying. My parents were killed in the line of duty when I was younger. While I had heard of death before, that was my first run-in. For the longest time, I trained, grew stronger, studied, grew wiser, all in an effort to stave off death, to hopefully find some jutsu that would make me so powerful that I could stop even those I cared about from dying. Maybe even find a way to bring those who perished back to life. Jiraiya continued to listen. These things he had known about Orochimaru to a degree, but it seemed his partner was feeling quite generous today and giving him a grand tour into his thought process. Orochimaru continued, I studied for so long, but in the end, the best I could find was not what should even be touched. Jiraiya stopped him for a moment. Wait, are you saying that you... Orochimaru looked away for a moment. No way. 
You learned to keep others from dying? How to resurrect the dead? Orochimaru looked back. Can I ask you something, Jiraiya? Jiraiya listened. Let's say you had a beloved puppy. Something you cherished with all of your being. One day that puppy's run over by a cart. The driver stops and attempts to give it aid, but it's too late. You arrive and see it in the throes of death, utter agony as it lets off a little whimper in your arms. It then perishes. Now say, on the same street, you see a happy child with their very own puppy. It jumps about and plays as the child laughs. Now say, the devil appeared to you and said, I can bring your dog back to life. And in exchange, all I ask is that you take this hatchet and kill that child's puppy. What would you do? Jiraiya was startled by this question. He knew Orochimaru long enough to know that this was an analogy to whatever path to immortality he had discovered. Jiraiya swallows. I would pass up the chance. I wouldn't want to hurt someone else to ease my pain. Orochimaru would smile. That is because you are a kind person, Jiraiya. But for the sake of the argument, let's say you took the deal. The child sits there in terror, tears streaming down their cheeks as they see you kill their beloved pet. As promised, the devil brings your puppy back to life. But when he does, the puppy is not the same. It's still wounded, covered in scars, alive and capable of moving about, but it no longer plays. It no longer barks. It doesn't do anything. It takes commands, but there's no joy in its heart. A walking corpse on a leash. Jiraiya was a little depressed from this conversation, but he knew that whatever Orochimaru was saying was important to his current mindset, so he listened. Jiraiya, I say this because I learned the cost of resurrection or immortality. If I so desired, I could use this ability on myself and live forever, but not knowing what it does. And that leads me to my new view of life. The only thing worse than dying is to live forever in this unjust and corrupt world. So, I've begun to dedicate all of my time and resources onto other projects. Projects that can heal people and save those who have yet to die. Jutsu that can defend and heal. Technology to make life better. We only get one life on this earth, Jiraiya. It's best that we spend it being happy, rather than worrying about when it will end. Jiraiya, at that moment, realized just how much Orochimaru had grown. He had not only grown intelligent in his studies, but wise, too. He had come to acknowledge not only the truths of this world, but the truths inside of himself, some of them painful and hard to look at. He had grown as a person, not just a scientist. And he knew that if Hiruzen had seen this in the time when the Third Shinobi World War had passed, that surely Orochimaru would have been the fourth Hokage. They continued to walk in silence. I didn't mean to ruin the mood, Jiraiya. Jiraiya snapped back to reality. Huh? No, 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 you didn't ruin anything. You gave me a lot to think about. I'm grateful to have that conversation, friend. Orochimaru let off a slight smile as they entered the building. Do you know what Hiruzen called us here for? Jiraiya asked. Orochimaru looked over. Likely something to do with the Chunin exams. Jiraiya was puzzled. Chunin exams? Orochimaru looked back. You didn't know? The Chunin exams are going to be hosted here, in Konoha. A time for the best of the best to prove themselves. It's going to begin at the end of the week. Jiraiya pondered this as they opened the door into Hiruzen's office. The elderly man sat at his desk while Tsunade sat on the couch, a look on her face saying she felt like she'd been hit by a train. Hiruzen looked to them. As I'm sure you're all aware, the Chunin exams will begin in one week. This means we're going to have people coming in from all directions. This is both a good thing and a bad thing. Good in that we'll see plenty of tourists and people with deep pockets checking out the businesses here. But bad in those that who wish to destroy us could just walk in without us knowing. Jiraiya listened. Are you thinking someone's going to try and attack us? Hiruzen nodded and continued. I have it on authority from one of my deep cover contacts that a certain group has interest in causing havoc here in an effort to sneak in and steal something of great importance. And what thing would that be? Orochimaru asked. Hiruzen pulled out a picture of a young shinobi. He slid it forward across the desk. Jiraiya picked it up and looked at it, realizing that it was the same boy he had seen earlier leaving the village. Orochimaru looked over his shoulder at the picture. Jiraiya passed the picture to Tsunade as he spoke. What's so special about this boy? Hiruzen continued. His name is Naruto Uzumaki. He's the current vessel of the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox. And he's the son of Minato Namakaze, your former pupil. Jiraiya's eyes went wide as he flashed back to all the times he had spent with Minato, along with the moment he received the news of his death. What would you like us to do? Orochimaru said. I've sent him out of the village on a mission for now. He should be safe with Kakashi and the others. This is a low-level escort mission. I wanted him out of the village as the other nations begin to file in so we could properly house and monitor them before taking Naruto into consideration. He should be back before the tuning exams officially start. When he does get back, I need you three to offer protection to him, personally. There's no one I trust more than you three. Can I count on you to do that? He asked. Each member of the team nodded and accepted this most important mission. 
Hiruzen would excuse them. For a few days, they just hung about, waiting for Naruto's return. When eventually he did come back, they kept close to him, but just out of the way. He remembered the scroll he had received the day Minato passed. It possessed the key to Naruto's seal, and was the embodiment of trust between Minato and Jiraiya. Minato was asking Jiraiya to teach Naruto how to learn to control his beast. Jiraiya had only just now remembered it. It felt as if fate were right now setting things up for Jiraiya to fulfill a prophecy and teach the child of promise. Perhaps Naruto was the one. Jiraiya was getting more and more excited about this task as he watched on. He followed the trio as did Tsunade and Orochimaru. It seemed that neither of them were conscious of the possibilities as they watched this child and his friends. Once they entered the building in which they would sign up for the tuning exams, they backed off and merely watched from outside, making sure that nobody came or went without their knowledge and identification. When the exams began in earnest, Jiraiya, Tsunade, and Orochimaru kept close. The first test wasn't so hard and they didn't really need to do anything, but when the second test rolled around, they were informed by Hiruzen that they were allowed to enter into the Forest of Death, but that they must at all times remain disguised and unseen by others, and above all, they must not interfere with the test whatsoever. This meant that they could not save Naruto if he were attacked or for any other reason besides taking his tailed beast. And so, that's just what they did. They gave him plenty of space and didn't dare come any closer. Due to this, Team 7 manages to complete the task with average time. After that came the first half of the third round, the exhibitions. Jiraiya watched closely Team 7's actions as they fought. Sasuke had a far easier time as he could use ninjutsu due to having never received the curse mark. Tsunade would come to Jiraiya and nudge him. Hey, you're supposed to be keeping an eye out for anyone who might want to harm Naruto. Jiraiya pointed out, Did you see how that Ochiha boy seamlessly went from ninjutsu to taijutsu? Tsunade rolls her eyes. Okay, so what? He's a prodigy. They aren't as once in a lifetime as they used to be. Jiraiya watched on, beginning to believe that Sasuke could also be a good candidate for the Child of Prophecy due to his pure skill that reminded him slightly of Minato's. Sakura would have her battle with Ino in which the two would fight well against each other, but it would end in a double knockout. That's sad, Tsunade said as she watched on. Jiraiya looked over. Whatever happened to watching Naruto over the matches? Tsunade looked over at him. That's what Orochimaru's for. Meanwhile, Orochimaru was also here, but he was actually doing his job. And since Tsunade and Jiraiya had gotten lazy on him, he had to call Kabuto in to watch. This became necessary after the battle between Rock Lee and Gara. When the doctors could not heal Gara, Tsunade found herself moved by the story of the ninja who could perform no ninjutsu, and that was allowed a short reprieve by Hiruzen to begin working on healing Rock Lee from his injuries. This was a dangerous time though, as a month's respite meant that they were doing nothing, all while visitors continued to come and go. Naruto was out of the public eye, which made it even more dangerous to them. So much so that Jiraiya decided to make this the moment when he made contact with Team 7. Orochimaru was slightly against this as it was not in their mission mandate, but Jiraiya said that it would be far easier for them to protect the group if they were training them, and it also helped them fulfill Jiraiya's secondary objective. They would approach the trio and their mentor and introduce themselves. Team 7 seemed rather skeptical of them from the get-go, but Orochimaru and Jiraiya kept up their friendly appearance, all while Kakashi hyped them up by explaining to his team just how legendary these two were. Jiraiya immediately let slip their mission and what they were doing and telling specifically Naruto that they'd been following him just to protect him. Our only mission here is to protect you, Naruto, but I've got a second mission that I set for myself. I wish to mentor you three. Of course, I wouldn't step your actual teacher's boundaries, he's still your teacher, but I have many skills I want to teach you, as does Orochimaru. Soon from now, once Tsunade's finished her business in healing that Rock Lee boy, she too will be here willing to teach. I feel that she'll have a greater connection to you there, Sakura, and she seemed more taken with your match against Ino Yamanaka. I feel that if we teach you three, you'll surpass even the first Okage. Does that sound good? Sakura seemed interested, and Naruto was over the moon the moment he heard that he might be stronger than the first Okage. Sasuke too was excited, though he held back any expression of that excitement save a rogue smile he couldn't suppress. And so their training began. During this time, Jiraiya would begin teaching Naruto three things. Number one, how to control his tailed beast. He does this by forcing a meeting via the tried and true method of yeeting a child off a cliff. Once a connection is formed, he teaches Naruto how to get more chakra from his beast, allowing him to attain and perfect his initial Jinchuriki cloak into the version 1 cloak. This goes faster than it does in the original series as Naruto was never forced to possess the 5 element seal by Orochimaru. Number 2. He teaches Naruto how to summon toads, in particular how to make use of the Nine Tails chakra to summon Gamabunta. Once he summons Gamabunta for the first time, Naruto is required to fight the toad to prove his worth, in which he just manages to punch the toad's head. 
This leaves almost no damage to the Toad, but the effort he displayed and the fact that he at least managed to strike him once causes Gamabunta to respect Naruto enough to allow him to summon him in moderation. And number 3. He uses the excess time left over to begin teaching Naruto the trick to creating a Rasengan. Naruto manages to learn this technique quickly, mastering the first and second stages, but having issues with the third stage, in which he would opt to use a Shadow Clone to allow him to successfully create one. All the while, Orochimaru is teaching Sasuke a plethora of his own techniques, including how to summon Manda. He also teaches Sasuke the importance of appearance. The final technique is something that's a bit harder for most. I sense that you may have the potential to make use of this technique, however. This technique puts off an air of terror to those who witness it. It requires you to make eye contact with others. Sasuke stands there for a moment and watches. Orochimaru's smile disappears for a second as he takes a few deep breaths. He opens his eyes once more and gazes into Sasuke's. In his mind, he imagines doing the most heinous and evil things to him, killing him in the most painful and morbid of ways. All the while, he derives pleasure from this line of thought. A smile forms over Orochimaru's face as he imagines this. All the while, Sasuke sees this and he feels like he's having a heart attack. His breathing intensifies. He can see it in his own head. He can see just how he'll die. He begins to panic, sweating. Orochimaru closes his eyes and once more his kind expression returns. He opens his eyes again and there's no hint of there ever being any hatred. Sasuke is shaken. What woe is that? He asks in a shaky voice. That, my dear Sasuke, was killing intent. And I believe you possess the ability to use it. How is it done? Orochimaru continues. The most extreme of emotional control. Think of your hatred as an eternal black flame. You can unleash it at will, but it will burn everything in your path. That's hardly helpful, as there may be something in your path you wish to preserve. And so you need another ability. You need control. The ability to control and shape the flames. In doing so, you will be able to focus your hatred and your ill intent, which both allows you to protect those you love from that pain and inflict it on your enemies with even greater volume. Sasuke sits there. That's... that's insane. Orochimaru laughs. Yes, it is. That's exactly what it is. Every good user of this technique requires some psychosis, a slightly demented nature. I sense in you an innate desire to commit murder. And from the end of that day, they found themselves back at the Chunin exams, each of them making use of their newfound abilities. Naruto's battle goes practically the same as he'd been taught by Jiraiya. The only difference is that he had the Rasengan here and uses it to defeat Neji. Now, things between Sasuke and Gara are a little different. The two stand there in the middle of everyone, ready to begin their match. As the match begins, they continue standing there, a deathly silence coming over the arena. Despite the match having started, nobody says a word. They're too scared to. Most are aware that the battle has begun, but isn't yet visible. In the silence, the sound of children crying can be heard as Sasuke and Gara both look deeply into each other's eyes. For a moment, Gara is caught off guard. He didn't expect such a feeling from Sasuke. Gara laughs as in his own head he can see his own mutilated body laying at the feet of those cursed blood red eyes. All the while it only fuels his anger more. Sasuke himself could feel this killing intent as well. But the difference between Gara and Sasuke was that Gara's intent was not focused. He was only hateful and psychopathic. He had no direction. He hated everyone and because of that his killing intent was diluted and spread too thin. Sasuke and Gara entered battle. As they struck out, the sand protected Gara from blunt attacks. But as he did this, many snakes left Sasuke's sleeves and crawled down his arm onto the ground, surrounding Gara. Gara would defend himself by releasing a large blast of sand, peeling the skin and muscle clean off the snakes, reducing them to nothing but bones. But as Sasuke came at him again, Gara's sand shield went up. To his surprise and horror, the sand quivered and moved to the side, getting out of the way. Walking between the sand, Sasuke came in, his Sharingan glowing in the overshadowing darkness of his hair hanging down. His gaze was poured into Gara as he drew closer. Gara began to shake. It is not you who was born into this world to kill other beings. That was me. Sasuke's mouth opened and he spoke. Perhaps so. But then who was born to kill you? Those words shake Gara to his core. In one quick moment, a snake from Sasuke's sleeve lashes out and bites Gara on the neck. Gara grabs it and hits his knees. He looks up at Sasuke in terror and Sasuke looks down on him without mercy or empathy. You broke Lee's arm and leg. I'm gonna make you feel all that tenfold return to you. Then you're gonna die. Orochimaru began to rub his temples. Oh dear. Gara, now in absolute terror, suddenly lets the beast within him out, just as his father had ordered. As soon as this happens, Rasa takes Hiruzen hostage. 
Tsunade and Jiraiya look to Orochimaru. You deal with Gara. we've got Hiruzen. With that, they get up to rescue Hiruzen from the Kazakage. Orochimaru jumps the side and races out to Sasuke. The Anbu appear and begin to evacuate the onlookers. Gara begins to strike out. Orochimaru looks to Sasuke and nods. The moment the arena is evacuated, Sasuke summons Manda, while Naruto on the other side summons Gamabunta. Orochimaru, on the other hand, utilizes the Eight Branches technique, as what can only be described as a Hydra appears. Together, the three face off against Shukaku, and as they slowly subdue this beast, Orochimaru pulls himself from one of the mouths of the Hydra where he spots Gara. He launches from its mouth towards Gara, his hand out, and utilizes the five element seal to strengthen the seal Gara had on Shukaku, which in turn causes the beast to fall away to sand, and Gara to fall to the ground unconscious. In the aftermath, the damage done to Konoha is very little, and Gara and his siblings are captured. All the while, Rasa was killed by the third Hokage and his two students. The day after, the Sanin and Team 7 meet up to go eat. As they do so, they speak. Jiraiya is proud of Naruto's abilities that he displayed in battle. This flatters Naruto, who is eager to return to training. Orochimaru, on the other hand, expresses his disappointment in Sasuke's lack of control. This takes a toll on Sasuke's confidence a little, but Orochimaru partly walks his disappointment back by stating that he's impressed that Sasuke got this far in such a short period of time. Sasuke perks up a little from this. Kakashi then asks the obvious question as to what happened. Jiraiya would explain. It seems that Suna has been going through some hard times. Ever since the Ninetales attacked 12 years ago, Konoha has been under hard times too. Our reputation's taken a hit, which is why the Sanin came back together. Just to get Konoha back in good standing, and it seems we may have done our job too well. We're now being hired out for every job that comes around, and that means Suna, which used to be the Land of Wind's go-to village, is being shunned in preference to us, which is causing them to drown in death. Rasa attacked us in hopes of ruining our reputation in hopes that it would bring life back to Suna. It's rather sad, actually, but it's the way things had to be. Kakashi nods in acknowledgement before looking to Tsunade. How about Gara? How's he? Tsunade looks up. He's in our custody and is actually doing really well. He seems to have been suffering from severe sleep deprivation. I don't know what Orochimaru did, but Gara has finally been sleeping. Quite a bit, actually. He only wakes up to eat before going back to sleep. I'm almost envious. Kakashi laughs at this. Jiraiya continues to eat, taking a sip of his sake as he looks to Naruto. We'll take the rest of the week off. After that, we'll begin our training in earnest. Orochimaru mirrors this sentiment. Team 7 seems pleased by this and they enjoy their meal. Jiraiya looks at his team and begins to see in them the makings of the new Sanin. They remind him so much of himself and his team and this pleases him, but at the same time he knows that they're likely going to be far stronger. In his heart, he begins to believe that he is training the Child of Prophecy. Whether it's Sasuke or Naruto makes no difference, he'll train them all the same and hopefully, through these teachings, the world will know its long-awaited peace. Out in the middle of nowhere they trained. They kept close to Jiraiya's home. It had been said by Hiruzen that he wanted Naruto secretly taken out of the village in hopes that this odd terrorist group that had been skulking about would lose track of him. Jiraiya was more than willing to accept, but the sleeping arrangements were lacking. This was a small house meant for at most two or three people. It now contained six. So many of the shinobi had to double up, if not triple up. Naruto, Sakura, and Sasuke all shared the same room. Meanwhile, Jiraiya had a room all to himself. He did offer to share it, specifically with Tsunade and Tsunade only, but she decided she would rather die, so she chose to sleep in the closet. Orochimaru got the living room. Crowded it was, and some of the Sanin weren't too happy about that. Orochimaru was asking why he even had to stick around, and Jiraiya told him it was to help teach the younger generation. It was then that Orochimaru hit him with a truth bomb. When you recruited me into this, you told me it wouldn't interfere with my studies. Now I'm sleeping in your living room for an indefinite amount of time. Tsunade is sleeping in the closet. Why can't you just teach and watch them yourself? Jiraiya's face displayed acceptance of guilt. I know I said that, but things have changed. These children aren't just a personal mission anymore, they're a mission from Hiruzen himself. So I'm sorry if you're uncomfortable, but it beats sleeping outside, right? I'm not so sure, Orochimaru stated as he turned his gaze away from Jiraiya. Team 7 wasn't doing too well either. Sakura tended to be tidy, clean, and dainty, and the way she slept at night tended to be compact and quiet. Naruto, on the other hand, was messy, sprawled out everywhere, and a loud snorer. Sasuke seemed to distance himself from it. The team had decided to split the room evenly, each one taking one of four corners, with the last remaining corner being considered right of way as the door in and out was in that corner. As time dragged along though, they began their training. They continued to train with their specific masters as well. 
Naruto is focused on his tailed beast training. Jiraiya would watch over him. You've mastered the version 1 cloak, but now comes the version 2, a far harder variant. As Naruto continued to study this, Orochimaru was teaching Sasuke. Let me ask you something, Sasuke, he said while looking through a book. Why is it that you're so full of hate? I sense it in you, your killing intent. The entire technique is based on rage and hate, and I sense a deep well within you that goes far deeper than even mine. Why is that? What could have possibly gained your ire with such intensity? Sasuke clasped his fingers as he leaned against the table, his eyes peeking over his hands as he spoke. I'm the last surviving member of the Uchiha clan. My entire clan was destroyed a long time ago at the hands of the one person I loved most. And now, now I'm going to find that man, and I am going to kill him. Orochimaru nodded. Scorn, the most powerful version of hate. In my experience, I will say that there is no hatred more powerful than that originally born of love. The moment you were betrayed, the moment you've been scorned, all of that overwhelming love switches polarity. Sasuke nodded. Itachi was the one I looked up to the most. I loved him. He wasn't just my brother, he was my best friend, my idol. He was everything I wanted to be. I set every bar and every limit to his standards. And then, one day, I come home and he's killed everyone I love. He slaughtered them and then forced me to relive it over and over and over again. And when I was in despair, when my fear was overrun by sorrow and I wanted to die, he told me that I wasn't even worth killing. He told me to seek vengeance and grow stronger that one day I would be strong enough to face him, strong enough to give him the battle of his life, and that's exactly what I'm doing. I will grow stronger. I will fight him, and I'll kill him. And when I'm done with that, I'll recreate my clan from the ground up. Orochimaru tapped a pen to his chin and nodded as he sat there, his legs crossed like he was some psychiatrist. Orochimaru stood. Fair. Then, I shall teach you many of my techniques. Do you know what a forbidden jutsu is? Sasuke nodded. It's a jutsu that should never be touched. Orochimaru smiled at that answer. That's correct. But do you know how something becomes classified as a forbidden jutsu? Sasuke just sat there silently for a moment. Orochimaru continued. A jutsu becomes forbidden when it crosses a specific line. That line is generally a moral line or a physical line that could lead to the death of yourself or someone else from attempting to activate it. Examples of such forbidden jutsu would be the likes of the impure world reincarnation, which requires a sacrifice, and the enslaving of a soul of the dead to your will. Another such technique would be the Reaper Death Seal and the Eight Gates of Death, the former because it causes death to its user and an eternity spent in the stomach of the Shinigami. The Eight Gates is also forbidden because it causes the death of the user. Do you know why I'm telling you all this? Sasuke didn't respond, he just kept listening. Orochimaru turned his whole body to face Sasuke. I'm telling you this because it's important to know that for every forbidden technique you use, there will be a cost. These jutsu are legendary and can perform feats far above and beyond what any normal jutsu can, but they have a cost that you must weigh in the balance. Losing your humanity, losing your soul, losing your life, the lives of your friends and family, becoming permanently disfigured. Each one has a cost. Each technique will ask you for something in return. I plan to teach you as many forbidden jutsu as I can, but I want to stress to you that these techniques should not be used lightly. Do you understand? Sasuke nods. Orochimaru smiles. Teaching you how to do these techniques will be hard, as I cannot actually display them, and you cannot actually physically practice them. So much of our training with these jutsu will be on paper. Sasuke nodded. Elsewhere, Tsunade was standing before Sakura. She walked around her slowly, eyeing her, all while Sakura stood silently. Tsunade came closer and jabbed a finger into her spine. What's with this posture? Sakura quickly stood straight. Tsunade then lifted Sakura's hand. What's with these noodle arms? Sakura's face grew redder with embarrassment. Tsunade stepped before her and stopped. I will not lie to you, Sakura. You're a very cute girl. Sakura smiled. Thanks. Cute gets you killed on the battlefield. Do you want to get killed? Sakura was startled by the outburst. Tsunade looked down on her, gazing with a judgmental stare down the bridge of her nose at Sakura who felt like she was getting smaller and smaller by the second. Tsunade continued, I watched that battle between you and the Yamanaka girl. I was not impressed. If anything, I was disappointed. You're a smart girl, but utterly naive. Sakura seemed like she was getting closer and closer to crying. 
This woman, who was every bit her superior in everything, intelligence, size, strength, looks, was currently belittling everything she did. She felt like trash right now. All she was waiting for was for Tsunade to mention her abnormally large forehead before she would lose control and break down into tears. Tsunade wasn't so cruel as to mention her forehead. No, wait, she was. Your big ass forehead is disgusting too. Sakura hit her knees and began to cry. Tsunade gripped her by the nape of her neck and lifted her off the ground. Listen, Sakura, I'm gonna make something out of you. You're my student and I'll be damned if I let those boys outdo you. By the time I'm done with you, you'll be the strongest, smartest, most resourceful, and beautiful of the whole group. Nay, the whole village. Everyone will see you coming and bow in respect. That's the only result for my apprentices, so quit blubbering and stand tall. I'm gonna teach you how to be the ultimate Kunoichi. Sakura's feet were finally allowed to touch ground. She dried her eyes. But why mention my forehead? How can I train that out? Tsunade held out her arms. You think looking good is this easy? I decide how I look through strength and ninjutsu, a constant transformation jutsu that I hold even while I sleep. You'll never see me on my worst day because I ensure every day is my best day. What I plan to teach you will show you that dedication and discipline on a physical, mental, and emotional level lead to a level of control that people too often neglect. I'm gonna craft you into my finest pupil a work of art so strong that the world will quake. She then pulled out a scalpel, causing Sakura to gulp. I, I don't think I'm ready for cosmetics like that. Tsunade's face twisted. Cosmetics? What the hell are you going on about? This scalpel is going to be your weapon, the tool you use to heal and kill with. Sakura was even more confused now. What? Tsunade continued. It was always my belief during my time in the war that every team should possess a medic. When the battle gets rough and your friends are dying, they're going to need someone strong enough to come to their aid and save their lives. That's going to be you. Now sit down and get ready. First things first, I'm going to teach you my rules for a medical nin. The first rule, never, and I mean never, stop a treatment until the person whose life you're trying to save has either made a full recovery or has died. Rule number two, a medical nin never stands on the front lines. That will not help your friends at all as it exposes the medic to danger and therefore the possibility of death, which leads us directly into rule number three. No medical shinobi is allowed to die until they're the last of their platoon. Sakura raised her hand. How can I refuse to die? Tsunade scoffed by deciding it. And if you're not capable of willing yourself to survive grievous wounds, then follow rule number two and keep yourself out of positions where you could die. It's paramount that you be there to help the wounded. If I give you my knowledge and teachings, then the way you act reflects upon me. I will not have my name dragged through the mud. So as long as you follow these rules in order, with priority given to the ones closer to the top, I will not complain. In a war, everyone is dying, killing, and being killed. So in no way ever are you allowed to be killed in battle. Stay away from the front lines. Sakura nodded and wrote it down. She closed her book. Tsunade glared at her. What are you doing? Open that book back up. There's one final rule. Sakura quickly opened it. Tsunade spoke. The last and final rule of them all. Number four. Only shinobi who have mastered the strength of a hundred technique, as well as the ninja art creation rebirth, are allowed to disregard the other three. Sakura was confused. Wait, those rules will no longer matter then? Tsunade nodded. The moment you master my techniques, you'll basically be immortal. You'll be the epitome and the answer to the old saying, Doctor, heal thyself. When you learn those things, you will be allowed to disregard the rules, fight on the front lines, and show the boys up with your strength. But to do that, I'm going to have to continually break you in both body and mind. Build you up, tear you down, and build you up again, all while flooding your mind with the knowledge, wisdom, and skill it takes to make you a reliable doctor. For most, it takes close to seven years of study and practice to become a doctor. You're going to do it in three. We're going to get started with those noodle arms. Hit the dirt and give me a hundred. A hundred, Sakura cried out in terror. Other shinobi generally only have to drop and do twenty. Tsunade stooped to her level. I'm not training you to be a normal shinobi. I'm going to make you a legend. And if you're going to refuse me, then just leave and go back to the village now. I've got no time for a wuss. Sakura seriously considered this for a moment, but she relented. That night, they all finished their training. Sasuke was already studying the materials that Orochimaru had given him. All the while, he wrote on paper, doing calculations and the like, trying to figure out the jutsu from that standpoint. This was far harder than it seemed. Sasuke wasn't used to studying like this. He was better at the physical stuff than the academic, but his drive to avenge his clan forced him to study as hard as possible. Naruto, on the other hand, was meditating in his bed silently. Jiraiya told him it was important to find his center and maintain his sense of self. His training with the Ninetales would surely drag up the beast's power and personality. He needed more strength of will and strength of character if he was to resist the invasion of the Ninetales into his mind. He opened his eyes for only a moment when he heard 
heard a loud thud. He peeked over to see Sakura laying face down on her roll, just panting and sweating. Training with Tsunade is a living hell. And so, after this, they continued up with their daily regiments. Given that they were being trained in both body and mind, they would often alternate to give time for proper healing. Tsunade would never push Sakura to work her body two days in a row, instead using that second day to pour all the knowledge of medical ninjutsu and practice into her head to keep from forcing Sakura to hurt herself by accident. Orochimaru would also take some time off to let Sasuke train physically, though he also used a special formula he would inject into the boy to help with muscle growth and chakra expansion. Naruto would train his body and technique on one day, and then the day after he would train his spirit and mind through meditation, in attempting to awaken and control the nine tails within him. Slowly, they were getting better at this. About a year and a half passed. Naruto, after much training, was sitting under a waterfall, meditating when suddenly Jiraiya called out to him. Naruto, break time! Naruto's eyes opened and he stood and walked over, taking a towel and drying off. Jiraiya would then offer him a blue raspberry popsicle. You earned this. They would sit down, using each other's backs as a backrest and began to eat their popsicles. Jiraiya would speak. I'm very proud of all the progress you've made. I'm hoping I can try version 2 again, Naruto said. Well, I was actually thinking we could try today. Naruto was silent for a moment. Jiraiya looked down at the scar on his chest. I know you feel bad about it, but don't. You'll do fine. I believe in you. So let's do it again, okay? Naruto nodded. Elsewhere, Orochimaru was standing with Sasuke. He looked him over. You've certainly grown in our brief time together, Sasuke. Very strong, very powerful. But as you know, Naruto and soon Sakura will have an ability that will increase their strength. Naruto will have his nine tails, and Sakura will soon have the completed strength of a hundred seal. And what will you have? Sasuke stood there and looked at Orochimaru out of the corner of his eye. It doesn't matter. I'll still be stronger. As soon as I awaken my Mangekyo Sharingan, I'll be stronger than both of them put together. Orochimaru nodded. Overuse of the Mangekyo will eventually lead you to being blind, will it not? Why not consider another path to power? And if you do awaken your Mangekyo, you'll still be far stronger with this new ability. I'm listening, Sasuke said. Orochimaru pulled out a vial and sat it on the table. This is some bodily fluid I've been able to take from one of my test subjects. He possesses a form of immense power not too different from the sage transformation one can achieve in Ryuchi Cave. With this, he can absorb sage energy and increase his physical strength by at least tenfold. By administering this to you, you'll gain the ability to use this technique just as he does. It will be painful and it will take some time for each stage to reach maturity. But when it finishes, I dare say that even Naruto and his tailed beast will have a hard time matching you. Sasuke thought about it and nodded. Do what you must. Orochimaru would open the vial. Slowly, his canine teeth grew out to resemble the fangs of a snake. He would dip each fang into the liquid and step closer to Sasuke. He would suddenly bite his neck. Sasuke would fall to his knees and cry out in pain. Orochimaru would then wait as Sasuke fell unconscious and took his body inside the house to his bed where he would lay Sasuke down and tend to him as his body continued to fight it. Orochimaru would kneel down. Once your body stops fighting it, it will assimilate this power into you, and you'll feel a wonderful release of power. Once that's finished, we may move on to phase two. After a few hours though, Sasuke's fever broke, and he let out a sigh of relief, his body having finally accepted this as a new part of itself. Once Sasuke awoke, Orochimaru asked him a simple question. How do you feel? Stronger. Orochimaru smiled as well, slightly nefariously. Next came the second half, fully assimilating the curse mark into his body. He would lead Sasuke to what appeared to be a large cask. What's this? Sasuke asked. Orochimaru smiled. This will allow you a deeper connection with your curse mark, allowing you to achieve a second stage. Orochimaru presented Sasuke with a pill. Sasuke smiled and swallowed it and crawled into the barrel. Orochimaru then put the lid on and affixed it with paper tags that would help the process further. And there he waited. Back at Naruto's training, he had been meditating for a few hours. Daylight was running out. Jiraiya then spoke. If you're ready, then it's about time for you to attempt to awaken your version 2. Naruto nodded. He then closed his eyes. He stood before the gate as the Nine Tails looked down on him. Naruto looked up and made his demand. He demanded that the Nine Tails provide him with all the chakra he needed. Suddenly, thick red chakra leaked out from under the gate and began to encircle Naruto, swallowing him up. He felt like he was drowning again. He was beginning to panic. He heard the voice of Jiraiya from afar. Fight, Naruto. Don't allow the beast to win. Naruto struggled. On the outside of his mind, his body was slowly beginning to succumb to this deep crimson chakra. It swirled about him and began to rise up his body as his face twisted and contorted, straining under the pain and pressure of the Ninetales hatred. Help me, he whispered under his breath. I'm drowning. Jiraiya sighed. It's still too early. Pull it back. Lock the beast up. Expel the chakra. 
You can rest now. Naruto began to struggle harder, but nothing happened. Oh dear. Jiraiya pulled the tag out of his pocket and walked over to press it to Naruto to suppress the Ninetales. Suddenly, Naruto's hand shot up and gripped Jiraiya's wrist with enough force that it nearly broke. Naruto's eyes opened to show those of a fox as a smile drew up his lips. Jiraiya pulled away. Uh-oh. Suddenly, Naruto was overtaken in this crimson chakra and rushed at him. Jiraiya kept attempting to put the tag on him, but to no avail. Making a little room, he witnessed Naruto let out a roar and a pillar of red chakra as once more he charged. Far away, back towards the house, Orochimaru sat with the vessel. He almost fell asleep twice, but he would manage to keep himself awake. Suddenly, the lid burst off and Sasuke jumped out. Orochimaru sat forward and watched with great interest. Sasuke stood there and looked at his hands. He began to giggle in the back of his throat before falling into a full fit of laughing. <laughs> this feels incredible! Amazing! So much chakra is swirling around within me! I can't wait to test it out! Suddenly, there was a bright pillar of light shooting up into the sky. Sasuke looked over at it with a shock. Orochimaru stood there as the red beacon of chakra rose into the twilight to kiss the sky. It seems your wish may be fulfilled. Naruto skittered along the ground and readied a tailed beast ball in his mouth, ready to fire. All the while, Jiraiya began to think that he was wrong. He shouldn't have asked Naruto to do this. Suddenly, before Naruto could fire, something flew through the trees like a fighter jet and slammed into him. Naruto tumbled along the ground to see Sasuke standing above him in his stage 2 curse mark of heaven state. Sasuke stood and began to weave the hand signs of the great fireball technique. He blew it at Naruto, enveloping him in flames. However, the version 2 cloak's chakra shell was so thick that the flames didn't even cause him any injuries. It was then that Jiraiya gave Sasuke the tag. Press this to his body and he'll revert to normal. Sasuke nodded and took it. He ran at the beast as he attached the tag to the sole of his shoe. Naruto came running at him. Sasuke then rolled forward, going under Naruto before planting the sole of his shoe into his chest. Naruto was struck and rolled along the surface of the lake before coming to a stop. The energy dissipated and Naruto was left there, unconscious and heavily injured. Orochimaru and Jiraiya would come to him and look. We need to get him back to the house, Jiraiya said. Orochimaru agreed, and together the three of them lifted him up and began to carry him. Sakura stood there. In this last year, her body had truly changed. Her arms were dainty yet muscular, and her abs had defined tone in them. She had grown taller and appeared more confident, and even had the beginnings of a strength of a hundred seal on her forehead. She was standing by a table, attempting to heal an injured animal under Tsunade's orders. To a point, after everything she had done in the previous year, this was small potatoes. She easily healed the bunny. There, broken leg has been fixed. Tsunade walked over and checked the rabbit herself and watched as it hopped along. Good work, you're really coming along. Within another year and a half, I believe you'll have mastered everything I set out to teach you. You'll finally be that ultimate kuno Lady Tsunade. I was sent by Jiraiya. Suddenly, they were cut off by Sasuke who appeared behind them. Naruto had a training accident and is in critical condition. He asks for your presence at once. Tsunade crossed her arms and sighs. No rest for the wicked. Together, they all head back to the house. They walk into the bedroom to see Naruto lying on his roll. Tsunade immediately knows what's going on and what happened, but instead she pushes Sakura forward. Tell me, what do you see? Sakura seems nervous. She had worked on animals and fish before, but never another person, let alone a friend. As if hearing her thoughts, Tsunade spoke. This is what you're training for, Sakura. Now show me that all my training did not go to waste. Sakura felt the added pressure, but she came down and looked Naruto over. Heavy burns, what appears to be extensive cellular damage, and at least one broken bone. And what do you recommend, doctor? Tsunade asked. Sakura looked. I recommend enhanced cellular regeneration via the mystic palm technique. After that, his arm needs to be reset to where it can be healed via that same technique. Tsunade nods. Begin treatment. Sakura slowly begins to apply her chakra across the body, working patiently as slowly the red covering his body is returned to its natural peachy color, or at the very least a light pink. This takes her quite some time to do, but eventually she finishes. She then moves to his arm while he's still unconscious and pushes the bone back into place before working on healing it. More time passes as she does so. Eventually, she's satisfied that the treatment is 100% successful and comes to a stop. Tsunade smiles. Very good, Sakura. Eventually, Naruto regains consciousness and opens his eyes. Huh? It's then that he asks the question, Did I lose control again? Jiraiya nods. Indeed. Tsunade begins to chastise them for it. You're too soft on him, Jiraiya. He'll never gain the strength of will to handle that if you don't teach him proper emotional control. Sakura here could handle that form no sweat. Jiraiya thinks about it for a second. Wait, that gives me an idea. He turns to look at the others. We've been training our respective students for a year and a half, and there's still a year and a half before we have to return to the village. Instead of just training each one individually, let's trade off in a cycle every month. If we can do that, we'll each get six months to train each student. That could round them out evenly. 
What do you say? Orochimaru thinks about it. It is a good idea. They say that a jack of all trades is a master of none, but we're not forcing them to focus on what they aren't good at, but merely to take time and learn more as to have no deficiencies. I would be lying if I didn't say I wanted so badly to get my hands on that impressive mind of Miss Harano's. She would certainly do well in the scientific field. Perhaps she can even find uses for some of my forbidden jutsu. Tsunade thinks about it. I could certainly help break Naruto out of his bad habits and possibly even teach him a few techniques to apply first aid to himself and others, just in case anything ever happens when Sakura can't be there. Jiraiya then spoke. When I took Naruto on, I couldn't be sure whether it was he or Sasuke that was the child of prophecy. And now, the chance to train him as well, I just can't pass that up. And so the three of them switched students, slowly alternating monthly just as Jiraiya had said. Jiraiya began to train with Sasuke and teach him many techniques, including the Rasengan. Sakura trained under Orochimaru where the two developed a bit of a bond over their love of learning. Orochimaru was impressed by how much information this young girl had stored in her mind, and she was so thirsty to learn more that he felt like he could teach her the things he couldn't even teach Sasuke. Naruto, however, was having one heck of a time. He was physically tired, mentally tired, and constantly being emotionally abused by this woman. In truth, Tsunade didn't like having to be this cruel to her students. The mind and the heart were two figurative muscles that also needed to receive exercise before they crumpled up and atrophied. It was a simple truth in the shinobi world, and so she pushed him physically and emotionally to his breaking point, until finally the month ended and she cycled him out for Sasuke. Naruto would immediately switch to Orochimaru, who was a little disappointed, knowing that out of the three of them, Naruto was the brick. He was the only one of the three who felt like he had the brain power of a toddler, so training him would be a pain. Sakura made her way to Jiraiya, and during the course of their training, he pegged her as a taijutsu main of fearsome and incredible strength, enough to shatter the earth below her fist. But this easily provided him with the proper information he required, that if she put her mind to it, she could learn any ninjutsu. So that's what he taught her. And like both Naruto and Sasuke before her, he taught her the Rasengan. As time passed, he even began to teach her how to make use of Sage Mode, as he felt that she, with her medical background and near-perfect chakra control, could handle it. And indeed she did. She even used Sage Chakra to quickly fill up her strength of 100 seal, which allowed her to further study under Tsunade to learn more about what she could do. Now, Tsunade trained with Sasuke for a while, and she was impressed by the serious demeanor he could keep at all times. But he was smug. He was constantly belittling others, showing that he was trying to find another avenue for this anger to escape from. This meant he was still out of control. And if you even mentioned Itachi in the same breath as you would insult him, he would attempt to fight you, insinuating that his impulse control could be almost as bad as Naruto's. This was something she had to teach with force. If he planned to get violent with his emotions, she would do the same. All in all, his stubborn nature made it near impossible for her to train him to control himself, and his constant challenges to her authority led her to dislike him a bit and see him as a brat. She would skip the emotional control part and simply move to first aid before focusing on physical strength. This cycle continued for the next few months until eventually the three years passed. The mentors stood there on the three-year anniversary to the start of their training and looked upon their students with pride. They had grown taller, stronger, smarter, and more controlled. Even Naruto had grown more intelligent. It took a long time for Orochimaru's methods to take, but when Naruto finally got his grasp, he began to learn at an accelerated pace, proving he wasn't a total moron. You three have grown so much, and we've already taught you everything we can, from jutsu to sage mode to control and problem-solving skills. You have everything that's required to match and surpass us, as well as any other shinobi in the history of the Hidden Leaf. Tsunade then spoke up. Remain disciplined. Continue your studies every day. Train and practice. Train and practice. Continue the cycle until you can make everything muscle memory, she said. Then Orochimaru spoke. And when it becomes muscle memory, shake it up so as to keep your mind sharp. This world is full of more mysteries than anyone can hope to answer in one lifetime alone. So keep learning more and more until your time on Earth is over, and eventually you too shall become legends. Jiraiya looked to his team and nodded as they looked back. He then looked back at the three and spoke. I can speak for all of us when I say this. We are heavily impressed by your dedication, and because you managed to learn all of our skills and show promise to surpass us, we plan to pass down our title. They then presented them with new Konoha headbands. Jiraiya continued as the group seemed to grow speechless. Within you lives our teachings and our strength. We live on inside of you, and one day you too will teach others, and your teachings will live on inside of them. The will of fire is passed down, and you will also grow to be legendary. And with that, they began to return to the village. Upon their return, the trio and their masters are greeted by Kakashi. Kakashi welcomes them back with open arms. The Sanin let their students catch up with their old master. Kakashi, in a moment of curiosity and nostalgia, decides he wants to test out his old students. So together they rush off to spar. 
All the while, the Sanin make their way to the Hokage's residence to inform Hiruzen of their status. The three walk in and are taken to the Hokage, but to their surprise, not to his office, but instead his bedroom. The door is opened and they're allowed to enter. Their eyes widen as they see. Hiruzen lays down in bed, strapped to him is an IV. By his bedside is a medical nin doing various checks. The three of them stand there in shock. After a moment more, Hiruzen dismisses the medical nin. The students come closer as Hiruzen bids them. Jiraiya is the first to ask, though it seems Orochimaru and Tsunade already know by the looks of the treatments. What's wrong? Hiruzen looks up at Jiraiya with a slightly tired look, but an ever-present smile. Just time catching up with me. Time and fate. Tsunade looks at him. How far did it come? Hiruzen looked up at them. It's stage four. We only found it a couple weeks ago. I'm glad that you've returned to the village. I was beginning to worry that I would miss you. You three know that my time as Hokage can't last forever. I must choose a successor. Hiruzen looked around at the team he once led, each one grasping his hand. I've considered it very carefully, and I think it's time that Orochimaru take my place. Orochimaru was surprised, though Jiraiya and Tsunade definitely weren't. Orochimaru spoke, but you told me when you chose Minato that I had too much darkness in my heart. Hiruzen nodded. And you did, but something within you changed. You've grown to be more caring, more kind and considerate. Orochimaru shook his head. No, I'm none of those things. I've done terrible things. I hurt people for the sake of knowledge. If you're looking for what changed in me, it was that. I witnessed death, murder. I witnessed suffering brought on by my own selfish desires. I'm not fit. You were right. There was darkness in my heart and I am unworthy. Here is a nodded. I know, Orochimaru. But it is that reason, and this reason now that I choose you. You made mistakes, and did the one thing with them that you were always best at. You learned. You adapted. You shed that skin and left it behind. You made mistakes, and you know you made them. And for each of them, I reprimanded you. But at the same time, you remind me so much of myself when I was younger. Myself and my own mentor, Tobirama. Some people say that when someone dies, they reincarnate into a new form. If Tobirama ever did reincarnate, then he became you. Your thirst for the truth and for the sake of science is nothing short of Tobirama's. Your heart has grown larger. That's why I feel that you will make a good leader. Orochimaru sat there for a moment. Is this your wish? Here is a nodded. It is. Orochimaru looked down for a moment, but then back up. I won't disappoint you. Here is a nodded. Study up on the role of Akage, things you're expected to know, the ways to build your administration. The information you need is in my office on the table in a package with your name on it. When I pass, I want you to take the position for yourself. That is my final decree as Hokage. Tsunade couldn't help feel the tears rolling down her cheeks. For all of her talk of emotional fortitude and self-control, she was ashamed to admit that she wasn't in control right now. Looking to Jiraiya, she could see that he was even worse off. We'll stay with you, Jiraiya said. We'll stay with you until the end. Hiruzen smiled. Elsewhere, Team 7 was walking into Ichiraku Ramen with Kakashi. They sat down for a meal. So what's up, Kakashi-sensei? Kakashi would order four bowls of ramen. Well, most recently, we've been keeping Gara in prison for his attack on Konoha. But after he showed some response to our psychotherapy, we've identified some of his issues and have helped him find ways to cope. Specifically, since Orochimaru branded him with the Five Elements seal, he's been far more docile. He explained to us why he was always so angry about his past betrayals and his lack of love, and about Shukaku's threats should Gara ever fall asleep for too long. It seems that at some point in the past, the stress built up and just shattered his psyche. We've been steadily trying to put it back together. Due to his good behavior, as well as his positive responses, we've been letting him wander around. He's taken up gardening, but there is an issue with this. He's had multiple attempts on his life. I know that that may seem natural given what he's done, but it wasn't anyone in the leaf. There are others, ones in black cloaks with red clouds on them. The Akatsuki. Naruto seemed confused. Who are the Akatsuki? Kakashi continued. The Akatsuki are a group of shinobi, generally S-ranked missing nin, who have come together to form a single unit, a band of mercenaries whose goals remain mysterious. That actually leads me to this. There's a mission for us. We're to be Gara's bodyguards. Considering that you are also a Jinchuriki like Gara, I believe it would be best for you and the rest of Team 7 to work security detail, since Gara and you may be able to relate, Naruto. And so Kakashi led them to Gara, who was even now tending to his garden. He held a watering can and began to water the flower bed. For the first time ever, they could actually see that Gara was smiling, pleased with his life now. 
He turned around and waved to Kakashi, who stepped forward. I see you're doing well today, Gara. The boy smiled. Flowers are my happy place. So long as I'm with them or thinking about my garden, I feel like I'm safe and happy. Kakashi smiled at the comments. He turned back. Gara, this is my own personal team. This is Sakura Haruno. Kakashi then turned around. I'm sure you remember Sasuke and Naruto. Gara smiled nervously. Of course. He stepped forward and offered his hands to them as a bead of sweat rolled down his face. It's a pleasure to finally meet you on more amicable terms. My apologies for any issues I may have caused in the past. Naruto took his hand and shook with excitement. No problem. Everyone makes mistakes. I'm just glad we can be friends. He said with such volume that Gara jumped a little. But this outburst somehow captured Gara's attention, as despite the fact that he was freaked out by it, he was curious to learn more about Naruto, as his eyes evidently showed. He then extended his hand out to Sasuke, who took one look at it before looking away. Gara retracted his hand as his nerves began to get even more high-strung. What brings you by? Kakashi then continued. After the recent attempts on your life, Konoha has assigned a team of shinobi to be your personal guards, as it seems Konkuro and Tamari could really use a helping hand. Gara bowed in respect. Of course, it would be much appreciated. Naruto looked down at the flowers and picked one. Gara's eyes snapped to him. What are you doing? Naruto looked over. Huh? Oh, I'm just picking a few flowers for Sakura. Gara grit his teeth. You shouldn't pick the flowers. You're not supposed to pick the flowers. He's not supposed to pick the flowers, he said to Kakashi. Kakashi looked up to Naruto. Uh, Naruto, please stop picking the flowers. Why? There's plenty of them here to share. He's picking my flowers. Kakashi put his hand out to Gara kindly, saying that he would deal with it. Naruto, stop messing with the flowers. That's a direct order. Naruto was confused, and so as he went to put them back, his foot crossed into a bed and stepped on some of the flowers. Suddenly, Gara is on top of him, screaming like a maniac. I'll murder you! I'll rip out your intestines and use them to hang you! It's then that a group of medical nin rush over to subdue him. They pull Gara off of Naruto and begin dragging him away. I'll kill you! Nobody touches my flowers! Sakura is appalled. Sasuke is shocked but not surprised. Naruto sits up and spits out a clump of flowers and the dirt attached to them at the roots. We're protecting that? He asks as Kakashi helps him up. Yes, specifically the beast inside of him. We don't know what the Akatsuki want, but with that beast, they would basically become a world superpower. So we gotta keep an eye out. And so they get to work. Sasuke gets a floor plan of Gara's home with the possible entrance points and places of interest. And from there, they just wait. For the most part, the Anbu do most of the heavy lifting. Team 7 just stick close to Gara, who, after recovering from his outburst, manages to recover his more amicable personality. They have dinner together, and for the first time, Naruto and Gara get to talk. Gara spins a tale of how he had been born premature, resulting in the death of his mother, how his father never truly cared about him, and how his own beloved uncle was forced to kill Gara, dying in the process. He explains the kanji on his forehead and its meaning, and why he has it. He further explains his relationship with Shukaku and with the people of the Hidden Sand. Naruto takes this in and realizes that Gara and he weren't so different. In fact, Gara is something that Naruto could have so easily become. It's sad. Naruto would open up about his own past experiences, some of which even Sakura and Sasuke had never known. How he was hated for reasons he couldn't explain. How he was abused, neglected, and how he never had anyone in the world that really cared for him save Hiruzen and Iruka before he joined Team 7. Sakura would put her hand on Naruto's shoulder with a sad expression, as if saying to him that it was all gonna be okay. That his suffering was over. Gara, after hearing these things, nods. I sometimes wonder what my life would have been like if I was never forced to carry this tailed beast within me. Have you ever wondered that, Naruto? Naruto thought about it. Not really. Gara's intrigued. Why not? Surely you wish you had a different life. Parents? Respect? No fear that your beast might take over or that people would come and try to take it? Naruto thought about it. Well, I suppose I do wish that I could have my parents back with me, but the life I'm living now, if it were changed, I wouldn't be me. I am who I am based on my experiences and the friends I've made and the bonds I've created. Those might not exist if my life was any different. Perhaps things for me would change for the better, but the cost of it being Sakura? Sasuke? Kakashi? I don't think it's worth it. Especially for something I don't know will even be all that great. Gara thought about it. I like that answer. Perhaps it's time that I think that way too. After dinner, Gara decided to go to bed. Gara was always early to bed yet late to rise. He seemed to get a full 10 hours of sleep nightly. Perhaps it was excessive, but when you haven't had a single moment in your life where you've slept soundly, the ability to be at peace in your rest seems to become an addiction. Naruto, Sakura, and Sasuke on the other hand stayed up. They stayed near the bedroom just in case. They sat down on the couch and turned on the TV to the news. It was a breaking report. Hey guys, come look at this. 
Sakura walked in and took one look at the screen and gasped, covering her mouth. Oh no. The report said that Hiruzen had passed away due to a long fight with an illness, and would be replaced by Orochimaru, who would begin active work as Hokage and would take the oath in the next few days. Naruto sat there as he watched the news. He seemed a little shocked by the news and had become uncharacteristically quiet. Sakura looked at him. After the story he told today, it seemed to her that Hiruzen had been one of Naruto's anchors through life. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, it's just that. He crossed his arms and squeezed his tear ducts as if trying to keep tears from falling from them, though he was failing. Sakura hugged him. She didn't say anything. Tsunade had taught her that the one thing you never say to a grieving friend is, I understand, especially if you don't, particularly if you've never experienced a similar trauma yourself. And because Sakura could not truly relate to what he was feeling, she instead merely remained silent and continued to hug him to show that he was not alone. Sasuke, leaning up against the far wall, watched the scene. A part of him felt bad for Naruto, but all the same, he kept his eyes and ears open for any sign of intrusion. There was no telling when someone would attempt to. Suddenly, there was a loud bump. Sasuke stopped and looked up. Guys, I think there's someone in the house. Sakura looked back, as did Naruto. The two then joined Sasuke as he rushed up the stairs. He opened the door to see an empty room. The window swung wide open. They jumped out the window and spotted a group of four people fleeing along the rooftops, all four wearing the same black cloak with red clouds. Over the shoulder of one of them was Gara, unconscious. They rushed after them, all while whistling out. Intruders! They gave chase. Naruto forms a Rasengan in his hand and then suddenly raises two fingers to his face. In that moment, he is teleported above Gara, having marked his clothing at some point in time. He presses the Rasengan into the face of one of their adversaries, causing a big enough explosion to send the other three flying back, causing them to lose their quarry in the process. It's then that the four Akatsuki members begin to engage Team 7 in combat. Hidan, Kakuzu, Deidara, and Sasori. Naruto faces off against Hidan and Kakuzu as Sasuke faces off against Deidara and Sakura against Sasori. As they do battle though, the alarm bells are ringing. Naruto would jump over Hidan and plant a Rasengan into Kakuzu. It doesn't take too long for him to figure Kakuzu's path to immortality. He possesses multiple hearts. Naruto takes this as a challenge and begins to attack him, resulting in many of Kakuzu's hearts being destroyed except for one. It's then that Hidan lands a strike and gets some of Naruto's blood. He begins his ritual and manages to wound Naruto via his damage transfer ability. Naruto is at Kakuzu's mercy. However, Sasuke, who has been paying attention, stops Hidan from harming Naruto any further by wrapping snakes around his arm and pulling him out of the circle. Naruto rushes at Hidan, sliding below the swing of a blade, dragging his hand through a small pool of blood, and then standing and smearing the blood on Hidan's weapon using sleight of hand. Hidan, thinking he wounded Naruto, would take a lick of the blood, and as he does so, another circle forms. Hidan stabs himself in the heart, but to his surprise, it is Kakuzu that goes down, having had his final heart perforated by Hidan. Kakuzu perishes. Naruto beheads Hidan, but to his horror, Hidan is still alive. Sakura manages to kill Sasori, and Sasuke manages to kill Deidara. They rush over to recover Gara, but instead they're stopped by a fifth man with hair as black as a crow's feathers. He turns to look at him with his Sharingan. Sasuke grits his teeth. Itachi. Itachi picks up Gara. This Jinchuriki is mine, Itachi says. If you want him back, then come to the old Uchiha hideout alone, Sasuke. If you bring anyone else, I'll kill this boy and take his tailed beast. And with that, Itachi disappears in a flock of crows. Sakura and Naruto both look to Sasuke out of the corners of their eyes, wondering what his reaction will be. It's then that Kakashi arrives with the Anbu. They capture Hidan's head to interrogate, and Naruto and Sakura tell Kakashi what happened. Kakashi looked to Sasuke and asked him flatly, What will you do? Sasuke looks back at him and says, I'm going to kill Itachi. At this point, they can't exactly stop him. Kakashi feels like Sasuke has a good chance and Gara's life is on the line. Even further, Sasuke's dream was to kill Itachi, so it seemed as if this was something that was going to have to happen. And so they let him go. They would follow him to the premises and wait outside as Sasuke would enter the building. There, he would find Itachi sitting in a chair resting. He opens his eyes. Tell me, have you finally awakened the Mangekyo Sharingan? Sasuke scoffed, as if I need them to deal with you. Itachi sat there for a moment. You do. You need them to defeat me. That was the entire point of me sparing your life. But no matter. It just makes it all the more easy to kill you. He stands. They begin by testing the waters with Genjutsu. Even when Itachi casts Tsukiyomi, he's only met with Sasuke's nefarious smile. No way. He resisted Tsukiyomi. After this, they try ninjutsu, in which Sasuke's raw chakra reserves, while not as large, are very well maintained via control. 
but in the sense of ninjutsu variety, Sasuke has the edge, as he seems to know more jutsu, in particular more kinjutsu. They continue up to the roof of the hideout where they begin to make use of taijutsu, which Sasuke surprisingly excels in. But what surprises Itachi more is that Sasuke is only getting started. Sasuke immediately goes to his second stage curse mark of heaven, and his chakra reserve, speed, strength, and all other stats increase tenfold. Beyond this, he gains the ability to fly. In this moment, Itachi is so proud of how far Sasuke's come all by himself, and so he continues to fight. But as things drag on, Itachi decides to use his break glass in case of emergency ability and awakens his Susano. Suddenly, with that, Itachi reclaims the lead. Sasuke even goes so far as to make use of Manda and the Eight Branches technique, but despite this, Itachi Susano withstands it. Any ninjutsu or taijutsu attack is caught on the Yada mirror, with the ninjutsu being absorbed by it. Sasuke begins to truly believe that Itachi Susano is invisible. He crawls along the ground to get away from Itachi. As he presses up against the wall, he sees Itachi approach. He stands there before Sasuke, blood pouring from every orifice. He smiles as he pokes Sasuke's forehead. Better luck next time, Sasuke. He then hits his knees and dies. Sasuke slides to the ground in terror. He sits there and looks at Itachi and can sense his life force having gone out. He suddenly bursts out into laughter, having achieved his dream of avenging his clan and killing his brother. But as he laughs, he can't help but look back on their time together, and tears stream down his cheeks as he laughs, and slowly that laugh turns into bitter wailing. Why did you have to do it, Itachi? He cried out, as if the body might give him an answer. Why? I'll tell you why, a voice said as it approached. Sasuke opened his eyes to see a man with a swirling orange mask. Sasuke gasped and kicked back, knowing that he couldn't beat this man as is, but also realizing that he couldn't escape either. Both caused by his lack of chakra. The man holds out his hand. Now, now, don't be so high strung. After all, I only came here to talk. What do you want? Sasuke asked. Toby continued. Itachi was a close ally of mine, and it pains me so to see him fight and die, hated by the one person he loved most. Sasuke didn't understand, and it was written all over his face. Toby then continued. Allow me to explain then. Itachi Uchiha never planned to kill the Uchiha clan. No, on the contrary. He planned to save them from themselves. You see, the Uchiha clan had been attempting a coup d'etat due to mistreatment. They were founding members of the Hidden Leaf. In fact, the village was created as a joint effort by the first Hokage, Hashirama Senju, and his dear friend Madara Uchiha, in an effort to end the wars waged by their clans. But when Madara felt betrayed, he attempted to take over the village for himself. The Uchiha would not join him for fear of starting the Warring States period all over again, so he attempted to do it himself and failed. Well, time passes, and eventually the Ninetales attacks. The Hidden Leaf believed this to be the fault of Madara Uchiha, who they thought to be long dead. They begin to persecute the Uchiha. Donzo Shimura had them pushed to the outskirts of the village and left to rot. But as tensions grew, Itachi and his friend Shisui developed a plan. A plan to save the village and the Uchiha. Before it could be enacted though, Danzo attacked and stole Shisui's eye, which possessed the ability that could save the Uchiha. He then, along with the rest of the council, urged Itachi to kill his own clan. They told him that if he didn't, it would mean war, and the leaf would not be overthrown. They further said that if he made them do it themselves, they would be sure to make his beloved little brother, that's you by the way, suffer. They promised that if he did this for them and took the fall for it, they would let you survive. Left with no choice, Itachi killed his own clan with the help of a certain benefactor just to protect you. And then he lied to you to make you hate him in hopes that one day you would kill him and return to the village a hero, then capable of re-establishing the Uchiha name. Your entire life's dream was just one Itachi fabricated for you. Sasuke listened to this and was shocked. But how do I know you're telling the truth? The man smiled beneath the mask. Because I was the benefactor who helped kill the Uchiha with Itachi. It was only done because I was ordered to. There were solutions, ways to fix it. It was politics that were used as a cover for genocide. An entire clan of people lost for no other reason than that they were so strong. But now that Itachi's dead, you have no one to protect you. I firmly believe that the Leaf will have you assassinated upon your return to ensure that the Uchiha are never allowed to rise again. Sasuke stood there. I don't know if I believe you. The man shook his head. You may not believe me now, but you will. You'll have to. And with that, the man disappeared. Gara was rescued by Sasuke and the two met up with the rest of Team 7. They commended Sasuke for his work and returned to the village. With Gara safe, they were allowed a reprieve. After the funeral of Hiruzen, a fairly emotional time for Naruto, they attended the inauguration of Orochimaru as the fifth Hokage, who took the vow to protect the leaf no matter what the cost. 
It was a time of great celebration, but Sasuke could not focus on that as he could only hear what the masked man had told him. It can't be true, right? He said as he thought about it. Konoha would never do that to one of its most prestigious clans. Sakura could tell something was bothering Sasuke, but she didn't say a word. After all, he had just killed his own brother, and even if it was something he'd always dreamed of doing, that came with a lot of emotional baggage. She had no idea. Later that night, Sasuke would return home to his apartment for the night and pull a page out of Naruto's book by heating up some ramen to eat. As he did so, he stepped out onto the balcony and looked over Konoha. At night, it was beautiful. From here, he could see the Uchiha compound where he had once lived. There were no lights there. A dead spot in the landscape, conveniently located at the edge. It was as if they were already planning for the Uchiha's lights to go out and didn't want to spoil the view. No, surely not. He was just giving in to paranoia. This wasn't true. It couldn't be. As he turned to enter his house, though, he heard the distant squeaking of wood. He stopped and turned his ear back. Suddenly, he rolled forward as a shuriken struck the doorframe beside him. He looked back. An Anbu death squad, he wondered to himself as they began to converge on his location. He tried to make his way out through the other end. As he opened the door to leave his apartment, though, another set of shuriken came at him. He closed the door once more to hear the thunking sound of the metal instrument striking his wooden door. He was boxed in. He rushed to the table and grabbed his shuriken pouch and strapped it to his leg. He threw the shuriken, each of which found their mark within the shinobi's throats, killing them. It was then that his front door was kicked in and another group of shinobi came in. He threw kunai with paper bombs attached at the shinobi. The bombs exploded, killing all who were in the hallway save one. The shinobi rushed through the smoke with his blade. Sasuke caught it with his kunai. Gripping the Anbu shinobi by his arm, he twisted him into a position where he couldn't fight back. Then, just then, a third squad came in from the balcony, blades raised to attack Sasuke. They approached them and swung their blades, only for their weapons to be caught on purple translucent bones. They were confused. Sasuke then finished the shinobi he was holding before looking back at them, his Mongekyo Sharingan active. He looked back at them with an icy glare, his hatred burning hot within him, knowing that everything that masked man had said was true. As he stared at them, all that hatred burning in him poured out from his vision at the others near him, catching them afire in the never-ending flames of Amaterasu. They screamed as they perished. But the flame set Sasuke's apartment on fire, so he quickly grabbed his bug out bag and jumped from the balcony, assuming that there would be no resistance. He then made his way straight to the gate where he would leave the village. He looked back on it with disgust, finally seeing the corruption there. His dreams had just changed. He had avenged his clan by killing Itachi, but now he needed to avenge Itachi by killing Danzo Shimura and the Council of Elders. And so he fled to the Uchiha hideout where he called for Tobi, who, to his surprise, responded. Tobi noticed Sasuke's bag and the wounds on his body as well as the smell of smoke. I assume I was correct then. Sasuke nodded. You were. I have nowhere to go, and at this point, I don't care who I join up with. I just need somewhere to go to plan the next step in my revenge. Which is... Sasuke looked at Tobi through his Mongekyo Sharingan, destroying the Hidden Leaf. The flames during the night had not been noticed until it was too late. The flames were black and did not give off much light. It was actually the sight of smoke and the smell of burning that gave away the fire. By this time, the fire had spread to the surrounding buildings. An entire block of the village was going up in flames and threatening to engulf the entire village. Acting fast, Orochimaru commanded that a squad of shinobi that specialized in barriers throw up a barrier around the affected area as water seemed not to help, but actually made the flames worse. This was a highly unusual thing and screamed to Orochimaru to have been some sort of strange technique. Was this intentional? Was the village under attack? The flames continued to burn well into the next day, but thankfully the barriers managed to hold off the flames. Eventually the fire burned out and nothing was left. There was nothing left to burn. Walking through the rubble, he found it to be a tragic sight. Only charred outlines where buildings used to be. People were searching through their belongings. There were people who had gone missing. Last seen within the buildings, some had heard screams coming from them, but as the buildings were checked, no bodies were found. For the loved ones of the missing people, this offered hope. Perhaps they escaped. Orochimaru hoped it was true, but deep in his heart, he knew better. Seeing how all the buildings had burned to ash, it was more than likely that nothing remained to find, and this wasn't out of the question. The barrier that had gone up served a dual purpose. It protected the outside, but the inside basically turned into an oven. Anyone within would have been cooked, even if the flames hadn't touched them. And that was the tragedy. Walking closer to where the flames were reported to have started, Orochimaru witnessed an apartment building, and on the ground outside of the building, he found a scorch mark in the shape of a human silhouette. He knew what that meant. He kept moving until the place where the fire had started came into view. The Anbu were already there, looking through the remains and ashes. 
Donzo Shimura was there, standing about five feet away from the operation. It eventually clicked with Orochimaru where he was. This building had been the site of Sasuke's apartment. What happened here? Orochimaru asked Donzo. Donzo turned and looked at Orochimaru. It seems that the flames were caused by a certain ninjutsu, possibly a kinjutsu, Donzo stated. Orochimaru sighed as he feared that this was somehow caused by his own teachings. But this fear was slightly alleviated by what Donzo said next. This isn't an unknown technique. It appears to be a Matarasu. It happens to be the technique Itachi possessed in his Mongekyo Sharingan. Orochimaru felt a sense of relief. But wasn't Itachi killed by Sasuke? Donzo nodded. We even recovered the body. Itachi is dead. Then how did this technique occur? Orochimaru asked. There are two possibilities. The first has to do with the state in which we found Itachi's body. When we recovered it, Itachi no longer had any eyes, which leads us to believe someone, likely Sasuke, took his Mangekyo Sharingan. If so, it's possible that the technique transferred. The second theory is that Sasuke, due to his genetic bond with Itachi, just so happened to develop the same ability as his brother. Either way, this likely means the culprit was Sasuke Uchiha. Orochimaru seemed a bit anxious by this time. Once more, feelings of guilt welled up inside of him. Sasuke was his student, and he had let this happen. Why would Sasuke do this? Danzo shook his head. It's possible Sasuke's gone rogue. What do you know of the Uchiha massacre? Orochimaru shrugged. Very little. Danzo nodded. As you should. It wasn't a decision made lightly. Orochimaru's eyes widened. Wait. Decision? It was an operation that Itachi carried out, under orders by Konoha's leadership. He then joined the Akatsuki to work as our deep cover operative within it. He was sending us information. Everything we know on the Akatsuki comes from him. But it seems he went rogue truly. He likely exposed Konoha's involvement to Sasuke, and Sasuke's hatred has been turned on Konoha. What we're witnessing may be a declaration of war by Sasuke, and it may be a message that tells us his intent. Orochimaru had not yet read through the classified operations history. He was surprised by all of this. Danzo turned to face Orochimaru completely. Sasuke is at fault for this. You must put a bounty on him immediately. He must be brought to justice for his crimes. And what of our crimes? Orochimaru asked. What of the mistakes we've made? The sins we've committed against him and his clan? Irrelevant, Danzo said simply. We act to protect this village, no matter what or from who. The Uchiha were a threat, so we put them down. Now Sasuke is a threat, and he also must be put down. A hard choice indeed, especially as a master. But as the fifth Okage, it is your duty. Fulfill it. Elsewhere, Sasuke was laying down, wrappings around his head covering his eyes. After Itachi's death, Obito had harvested his Sharingan. Currently, those Sharingan were implanted into the head of Sasuke Uchiha, and he was healing. At first, Sasuke had not considered this at all, he didn't know why he was doing this. It was only then that Obito explained what happened when two brothers bearing the Mangekyo Sharingan swapped eyes. The Eternal Mangekyo Sharingan, a dojutsu achieved only once in recorded history by a man named Madara Uchiha. These dojutsu are stronger than the regular Mangekyo, and they will never lose their light. You will never find yourself blinded from use of these, a little piece of Itachi for you to carry with you wherever you might go. Use it to destroy Konoha. Use the eternal black flames that you and your brother share to cleanse the village of the corruption at its heart. Sasuke laid there and listened. He already had his goals in mind, the retribution he would bring. He was focusing it. He remembered Orochimaru's teachings. The black flames of his hatred were hot and could burn anything within the line of his sight, but he required focus. It was as if those teachings had become one with him. With his ability, Amaterasu, as well as Kagatsuchi, those teachings had become literal. His hatred had taken form. But due to Orochimaru's training, he had learned to focus and control it. That was what Kagatsuchi represented to him. Due to these, Sasuke had already decided within him that he would not kill the innocent unless they attempted to stop him from achieving justice. Then he would hold them in contempt and would offer them the same fate. He only had three targets on his list. Hamura Mitokado, Kaharu Utatane, and Donzo Shimura. These three must die. If they were sacrificed, he would be pleased, and he would feel his hatred and lust for revenge slaked. Sasuke sat up. I have my goals in mind, and I will complete them. You've done your work, now leave me be. Obito stood there silently. He then spoke. You seriously believe you'll be able to bring down the entire village on your own? Sasuke shook his head. I do not know, but regardless, I do not plan to. I don't need to destroy the village. 
only the council. I know the shinobi there. I have friends there, and my mentor is now Hokage. I trust his judgment. The village does not need to be destroyed, only the corruption. And that is what these new eyes will do and will see. After all, that was Itachi's goal all along, to save and preserve the village and remove threats to it. And right now, the biggest threat is the council. Obito sighed, if that is your wish. Sasuke stood and momentarily placed his hands over his eyes. He then removed the bandages. Obito tried to stop him, but Sasuke silenced him with a stare. I was taught basic first aid by Tsunade. I learned further how to heal various wounds with ease via the mystic palm. I've healed my own eyes. I don't need these bandages anymore. He tossed them to the side. He then began to leave. As he did, Black Zetsu rose from the cracks. You should have heeded my warning. He is as stubborn as ever. He will not fall for our tricks. He'll soon become a dangerous enemy. You should consider killing him now while you have the chance and claiming his eternal mangekyo to use for later. Toby stroked the chin of his mask as Zetsu spoke. Perhaps. They sat silently as Orochimaru explained everything to them. Orochimaru had invited Jiraiya, Tsunade, Sakura, and Naruto to lunch and was currently explaining everything. He even presented the classified case file for the Uchiha downfall. And yes, he could share it with them even if they were Genin. He was Hokage and that meant he could do whatever he wanted with this information, including declassify it to specific parties. That's horrible, Jiraiya said as he looked through the case. Tsunade thought about it but it was to protect the village, wasn't it? Naruto's hand slammed down on the table. No, I refuse to believe that there was no other way. Tsunade looked to her student. Remember your control, Naruto. Naruto took a deep breath and sighed. You're right, I'm just very high strung right now. Tsunade couldn't say she didn't understand. She too was high strung. It's okay, just remember, your emotions can be your strength, but only so long as you control them and not vice versa. Sakura spoke. Was there any attempt to put it down peacefully? Orochimaru looked at the file. There is no record of previous attempts to do this, but what is strange is that this case file states that it was supposed to be the Anbu who put down the uprising, not Itachi. And the timeline, it's all wrong. There wasn't even supposed to be a massacre. It was planned to be a suppression of insurrection that should have stopped as soon as the Uchiha's ability to resist was neutralized. Sounds like something in the plan went wrong, Jiraiya stated. Orochimaru stood and turned to look out the window. Something about this feels wrong. Konoha's official plan and Konoha's actions during that night make no sense. Itachi wasn't even supposed to be in the squad, let alone the one to destroy everything. Perhaps it's a cover-up, Tsunade asked. Orochimaru shook his head. No, I almost feel it was a conspiracy. Danzo all but confirmed that Itachi was working under the Anbu's orders, but the Anbu did not receive any such orders from Konoha leadership, not from Hiruzen anyway. Then who do you think is at fault? Naruto asked. Orochimaru thought about it for a moment. Good chances point to Danzo. The paper trail doesn't connect very well, but it's known that the day after the incident, Danzo's root division was shut down. I don't know for certain, but I'm pretty sure that complete genocide is a human rights violation, Jiraiya said. Orochimaru looked back at him for a moment before looking back out the window. It is, at least here in Konoha. The total eradication of the Uchiha clan would not sit well with the rest. No doubt they attempted to cover it up with Itachi. So then, what do we do about it? Jiraiya asked. Orochimaru thought. I'm not sure. If we tell the people about what happened with the Uchiha, we could have a revolt on our hands. Other clans would lose faith in us, and we would be left wide open. Naruto thought for a second. So, if Sasuke truly is trying to destroy Konoha, what do we do about it? Jiraiya interjected. It's possible that Sasuke isn't trying to destroy Konoha. All eyes turned to Jiraiya. He scratched his chin and opened one eye to look at Naruto and Sakura, each who were waiting on his word to give them hope. He continued, Sasuke may not be trying to destroy Konoha. He may very well be on the run. For all we know, it was Danzo who set that fire in an attempt to kill Sasuke and blame it on a Kinjutsu gone wrong. He may be trying to simply silence Sasuke since he was the last one to speak with Itachi. Maybe Itachi told him the truth. Maybe he discovered it on his own. Maybe Danzo just doesn't want to risk any loose ends. I find it highly suspect that Danzo just knows that Sasuke didn't die in the fire and is on the lamb. Naruto stood once more. That's right. That has to be right. Sasuke would never try to destroy the village. He's loyal. He's a friend and he loves us way too much to hurt us. Orochimaru turned to look back out the window. He knew that wasn't true. If Sasuke determined that he had been slighted, he would seek revenge. That was the very basis of who he was. His entire personality for years was centered on his vendetta against his brother. If his brother was also a victim and Sasuke knew that, then whoever was responsible might as well kiss their ass goodbye. 
All the while, Tsunade looked to Orochimaru and noted that the same was true from her standpoint. She knew how far he was willing to go for revenge, and she hated to think what he had become now. So, what do we do then? Sakura asked. Sasuke's being hunted, and if we don't do something, they're going to kill him. And if we bring him back to the village, they'll kill him. Our chances of finding Sasuke and bringing him back alive are slim. Orochimaru thought on this. I'll halt the order for execution. If found, teams must bring him back alive. I'll use the question of innocence as a reason. Jiraiya looked to Orochimaru. If you do that, Donzo will know you're onto him. He won't let it stand. Orochimaru looked back. He'll have to. I'm the Hokage. His power is derived from me. I could and should have him arrested for treason. But... But what? Tsunade asked. Orochimaru took a deep breath. I fear he'll bring the village down if I try. He possesses the ultimate reverse card on us. Intelligence. And so, the order to kill was put on hold for a time. Sasuke was to be brought in alive. Danzo, of course, realized this and knew what Orochimaru was planning to do. He would smile. He put together a dossier of the many things Orochimaru had did that Hiruzen had covered up, the human experimentation being one of them. He didn't need to bring down Konoha, he just needed to bring down its Hokage. If he brought down Orochimaru, Danzo's place as Hokage would be all but assured. But as it stood, he didn't think he needed to bring Orochimaru down, merely bend him to his will. Danzo could do so much more from the shadows outside of public view, and with this dossier, he could have access to anything that the Hokage did. In essence, Danzo was the Hokage. He was merely ruling from the shadows. This was irksome to him as he truly desired to be remembered as Hokage, but then again, no Kage could have as much power and influence as Danzo did. Team 7, or what remained of it, was busy on the hunt for Sasuke. Given their connection to the Hokage, they had the best resources possible, and Orochimaru would even have the hunt sabotaged at times just so he could ensure that if anyone found Sasuke, it would be Team 7 or the other members of the Sanin. But eventually, he found himself being sabotaged as the Anbu was beginning to present him false information, intending to throw him off the scent while simultaneously sending out of uniform shinobi and hiring out mercenaries and assassins to bring Sasuke down. But by sheer luck, something cropped up. A strange rumor. He overheard it while walking down the road one day that Naruto had been seen in a store buying more ramen and things of a similar order. This wouldn't be that strange at all as Naruto often bought ramen, but the difference was that it stated that he had bought ramen earlier that afternoon, which should be impossible. Orochimaru had sent him out of the village to search for Sasuke days earlier, and so during the night, Orochimaru decided to try something himself. He removed his Hokage clothes and replaced them with something darker and not quite as conspicuous. He left the residence and entered the shadows of the alleyway and began to make his way through the village. Eventually, he came to a stop outside of the Uchiha clan compound. Illuminated only by the moon, his path made clear by the glowing light from the heavens above, Orochimaru made his way deeper into the compound. If the rumor he heard earlier was true, then someone wanted to keep their identity hidden using Naruto as a guise. And whoever was doing this was doing it only to gather supplies. Whoever it was did not want anyone to know they were in the village. The only place in the village that was abandoned was the Uchiha clan compound, so he decided to come out here and check it. He eventually saw the former home of Fugaku Uchiha. He looked at it for a time and thought he saw a shadow moving from one side of the upper floor to the next. Orochimaru was certain that this had to be Sasuke, but on the off chance that it was someone else, he needed to be prepared. He pulled a kunai and slowly made his way to the building. Stepping in, he could smell the ramen cooking. He made his way upstairs, each step carefully planned each step taken at just the right pace to keep it from squeaking. Once he made it to the top, he began to make his way toward the only room where light escaped. He peeked in and saw nothing. Suddenly, an arm wrapped around his neck and a kunai is pulled to his throat. How did you? A tripwire. Your age is catching up with you, master. Orochimaru took a deep breath and threw his kunai on the floor before removing his shuriken pouch entirely. I didn't come to fight, just to talk. Sasuke would let his mentor go. He would step inside where water was boiling. It seemed that he was living straight from this room. It made sense. It was mostly protected and light couldn't escape. No one could see in or out, and by the looks of it, everything he needed was here. He was well prepared for anything. What are you doing here? Sasuke asked. Orochimaru sat down. I came looking for you. So it's true. You really wish to destroy Konoha? Sasuke thought for a moment. I want to destroy a version of Konoha. The secret Konoha. The one no one sees. The corrupt one. Orochimaru nodded. Yes, I think I know the one you mean. Sasuke sat there. I don't want to hurt you, or Naruto, or Sakura, 
or anyone else in the village. I just want to destroy three people. Give me their lives and I'll leave you in peace. Orochimaru sighed. If you do that, you can never show your face around Konoha again. Are you sure you want to do that? Sasuke nodded. If that's what it takes, I can start a clan anywhere. Orochimaru shakes his head. You have a price on your head, Sasuke. And if you kill the elders, that price will go up. Nowhere will be safe. You'll never be able to restart your clan. Sasuke looked to Orochimaru. What other choice do I have? I must avenge my brother. Orochimaru thought for a moment. Do you remember what I told you when I taught you to utilize killing intent? Your hatred is like an eternal black flame. It burns everything in your path. But there may be something in your path you wish to preserve. So you need control. Right now is that moment. If you wish for justice for your clan, I'll help you get it. But you need to turn yourself in. I'll protect you. We'll prove you didn't betray Konoha. Sasuke looked up at him. And how do you plan to do that? I'll have Donzo and the other council members removed from their posts, forced into retirement. I'll have them replaced by people we can trust, Tsunade and Jiraiya. They can fulfill those roles. Sasuke shook his head. A cushy golden parachute is not my idea of revenge. They need to pay for what they did. Orochimaru thinks about it. How about we bring you in? Another voice spoke, cutting Orochimaru off. Sasuke stood and utilized Amaterasu's black flames on Donzo. Donzo burned, but in a moment he appeared elsewhere. What a poor choice. He snapped his fingers, and suddenly many Anbu operatives breached the room and took Sasuke. Orochimaru stood. Now wait a minute. I found him first. I demand that he be turned over to me. Donzo offered a sly smile before providing Orochimaru with a manila envelope. Orochimaru opened it and looked in at the contents. He looked up at Donzo, whose smile was growing wider. Checkmate, Lord Fifth. The boy comes with me and he will soon disappear. He'll never be heard from again. All you have to do is sit back and let it happen, just like Hiruzen. Let me do my job, which is to say, let me make all of your problems go away. Donzo turned and began to leave without another word. Team 7 eventually returned to Konoha. It was late at night and they were ready to get home and rest, but before they could, they were summoned by Orochimaru on urgent business. They would make their way to the Hokage's residence where Orochimaru was waiting. What is it, Sneaky Sensei? Naruto asked. Orochimaru sat at his desk grimly. We've located Sasuke, but he's currently under Anbu care. Sakura stepped forward, a concerned expression on her face. But we have to get him back. We can't let Donzo do whatever he wants. Orochimaru shook his head. I would have ordered he give him back, but Donzo has dirt on me. And if he leaks that, my time as Hokage will come to an end. All of the power I could use to defend Sasuke will be gone. I can't do anything. Naruto stood there. Then what do we do? Are you telling us that we can't save Sasuke? Orochimaru shook his head. No, there is one chance, but it'll have to be you. I need to know, what are you willing to do to save Sasuke? Naruto and Sakura both in unison spoke. Anything. Orochimaru nodded. He pulled out a map. My sources tell me that Sasuke is being held at this secret facility here. He pointed to a place on the map just beyond the village proper. If you hurry up, you may be able to save Sasuke before they have him executed. I just pray that we're not too late. Naruto and Sakura nodded. They took the map. We won't fail you. We won't fail Sasuke. They left. Tsunade sat on the desk as Jiraiya took a seat. Are we really going to let those kids risk their lives for something that isn't even their fault? Jiraiya asked. They didn't do anything to deserve this. They were cheated. Are we really going to sit here and watch? Tsunade looked to Jiraiya. What do you suppose we do? Our hands are kind of tied. Orochimaru looked at them both. I may have an idea. Sakura and Naruto were standing just outside of the installation. What appeared to be a single manhole cover was all that was covering the entrance to the underground facility. I don't sense any guards, Sakura stated, her eyes displaying the toad-like eyes that signified she was using sage mode. Naruto nodded and began to make his way down. Stop, Sakura said as she grabbed his collar. He looked back. She pointed in front of Naruto. At the base of a tree was a device that sent off an infrared beam. On the other side was a receiver. She spoke. It's an electronic tripwire. If you break the beam, the alarm goes off. They'll kill Sasuke. Naruto would also enter sage mode. Thanks, Sakura. I need to pay better attention. Naruto and Sakura bypassed the tripwire and kept an eye out for more traps. Once they were passed, Sakura looked at the entrance to ensure that there was nothing to the entrance that could be a trap. Once she was sure, she carefully lifted the cover up, to which Naruto was surprised by her strength. Together, they made their way in. First things first, Sakura said. We need to find where they're keeping Sasuke. Best way to do that is to reach the control room. If we do that, we'll be able to find him anywhere in the building, as well as sabotage any traps. Naruto nodded. He looked around. 
there was a camera. How do we bypass that? Sakura asked. Naruto looked down. There was a graded floor below them that allowed them to look down into the lower levels. Naruto began to climb over the side. Sakura covered her mouth. She looked down. The drop was so far that she couldn't even see the bottom, but she could, however, see the next floor below them. Too bad that wasn't where they were going. Besides that, it was under too much surveillance. Naruto's fingers came up through the grating. Come on, he whispered as he began to slowly monkey bar his way over. Sakura hated this idea, but she did it as well. Don't look down, don't look down. Together they made their way to the other side. Once they were past the camera's field of vision, Naruto and Sakura hauled themselves back up and entered a long hallway. They passed by room after room. They looked at the map of the facility that Orochimaru had presented them. The control room was nearby. All they needed to do was get there undetected. They managed to make it to the control room where they knocked out the guard and began to look at the control panel. They located Sasuke and found a proper route to his cell. They began to deactivate the security system and blind any cameras to it. Once this was done, they left the room and made their way down in an elevator to the prison room. Sakura, utilizing the transformation jutsu, transformed into the Anbu agent they saw in the control room. She walked right past the guards and grabbed the key. She and Naruto made their way to Sasuke's cell and opened the door. Sasuke, they called in. They saw his Sharingan glowing in the darkness. I'm here, he whispered back. They made their way in and unlocked his bindings. He stood and they began to escort him out. They took the elevator back up to the top floor and began to make their escape. However, before they could get to the entrance, Anbu appear and surround them. From behind, Danzo walks up. Gutsy move on your part. Two desperate friends, willing to sacrifice it all, break into a secure facility just to rescue their friend. Brave, but foolish. And now you will all be executed for treason. That should serve as message enough to Lord Fifth on what it means to cross me. What it means to cross you? Another voice came. Team Seven looked back and saw Orochimaru coming. I'm not crossing you. I'm putting it all to an end. Donzo looked at him with confusion. Are you sure you want to be saying that? You know how very little power you have. Orochimaru nodded. I thought about that. What you said, what I know. And I came to realize that I did have power. The last thing I can do to protect my students. It's time that Konoha pay the piper, Donzo. Suddenly, an Anbu agent walked to Donzo and whispered in his ear. Why don't you let us all be informed, Donzo? A TV monitor was activated. The local news was on. An anonymous leak had been reported, and various case files Konoha had were presented to the news agency. This news spoke about Konoha's hand in the Uchiha massacre, as well as Orochimaru's part in human experiments. It confirmed the existence of Root to the general populace and exposed a secret shadow government within Konoha that tried to cover up Konoha's involvement in the destruction of the Uchiha clan. It implicated Danzo Shimura, Homura Mitokado, and Koharu Utatane as the masterminds behind the genocide. Just as this was said, Konoha's police force raided the facility with a warrant signed off by Orochimaru himself. The police force also possessed a warrant for the arrest of Danzo Shimura and ironically Orochimaru too, all of which were signed by Orochimaru. Backed up with more of Konoha's forces, the police force would arrest Danzo forcibly. Danzo was smart enough to realize that he couldn't get away. Sasuke stood there and watched what was going on. The Anbu forces surrendered without a fight, and Danzo was escorted out. Orochimaru was also escorted out in handcuffs. He stopped for only a moment. See, Sasuke? I told you I would help you get justice. All it took was focus. He was eventually escorted out as well. In the end, the Konoha Council was charged with conspiracy to commit mass genocide. Danzo himself was charged with one count of mass genocide, and Orochimaru was charged with multiple accounts of human experimentation, which led to bodily harm and death. All groups were sentenced to life in prison. Now, of course, Orochimaru could have pardoned himself, if he were still Hokage. Sad thing was, he resigned from his post just prior to his arrest to offer justice. He had done many horrible things in his life, and he was ready to pay for each of them. He wanted Konoha to maintain faith in its government though, which is why he also allowed himself to be imprisoned. He wanted to out all the darkness that had been festering under the surface. And because of this, to honor what Orochimaru had done, Sasuke considered Konoha's debt to the Uchiha paid. Sasuke himself was pardoned, and in return, Tsunade was named the sixth Hokage in Orochimaru's place. All seemed well with the world, but sadly it wasn't. Outside the village, Tobi stood, looking out over the buildings. Black Zetsu appeared beside him. I told you, you should have killed him when you had the chance. Tobi looked to the black glop that possessed a mouth and eyes. Don't worry, Zetsu. Soon Konoha will fall, Sasuke will die, and both the One-Tail and Nine-Tails will be in our possession.
Sasuke sat in a room all to himself. It was a pure white room with a simple table and chairs in the center. As he sat there, he picked at his fingernails. A door opened and a shinobi stood there. He didn't say anything at the current moment and instead pushed the door completely open and held it there. It was then that a certain pale-faced individual walked in, hands and feet cuffed in a basic jumpsuit, a smile drawn across his lips. Orochimaru sat down, displaying that grin that almost seemed intimidating, like he'd been up to something you didn't want to ask about. All the time, he just naturally looked like he was up to no good, despite the fact that Sasuke knew better. How have you been, master? He asked. Orochimaru got comfortable in his chair. Wonderful. Every Wednesday, they hold a bingo tournament. I was second runner-up in the last one, if only Danzo didn't have Izanagi. Sasuke smiled about that as his gaze turned downward toward the table. Orochimaru noticed this, but didn't say anything about it. It wasn't his place to pry into Sasuke's feelings, and he never took Sasuke as one who enjoyed having his personal life dug into. All the same, he was curious, and his face whispered that. Sasuke spoke. I wanted to thank you for what you did. You helped me achieve justice without sacrificing my life and friends to do so, without sacrificing my future. And while I still want the council dead, their debt is paid because of your sacrifice. I suppose we all have a reason to be grateful to you. Orochimaru scoffed. What has happened to bring you to such a point of gratitude? Highly unusual. Sasuke laughed a little. For many years, I dreamed of settling the Uchiha's accounts, and it continuously grew more and more complicated every step I took. But you helped so much. When I was hunting Itachi, you offered me training. When I was hunting the council, you gave up everything for me. You've helped make my dreams come true. Orochimaru laughed. I did nothing. You made these things happen yourself. I merely settled my own accounts. Sasuke nodded. Indeed, I'm also not done with my dream. I have to bring my clan back, and to that end, I am making progress. Orochimaru raised a brow. Sasuke raised his happy gaze to meet Orochimaru's. Sakura and I have been dating for a while, and we've decided to wed when we reach the legal age. Orochimaru offers a slight clap of his hands. Congratulations. You'll have to send me a slice of cake. Sasuke laughs. Better yet, I'm asking Lady Tsunade if she can bail you out, at least for a day, to be there. I was kind of hoping that you might officiate. Orochimaru's gaze turned down with a bit of shyness. The honor is appreciated, but that perhaps isn't the best idea. I'm not favorably viewed in Konoha these days, and to have such a person officiate would likely be a negative omen for you. Or at least viewed that way for those who believe in omens. Then it's a good thing I don't believe in bad luck, Sasuke said. It would mean the world to us. Sakura has already asked Lady Tsunade to be her bridesmaid. Jiraiya is planned to be my best man. He's already writing up the toast. Orochimaru's brow furrowed as his smirk climbed his face. He knows it's two years from now, right? Sasuke nodded. He does, which is what's scaring me. And what of Naruto? Orochimaru asked. Naruto's gonna be there as well, my second best man. No law saying I can't have two of them. Orochimaru let out a guffaw. No, there is no law. Sasuke continued. Naruto has also been seeing someone, though I don't think he's taking it as seriously as Sakura and I have, but he's shown some interest in Hinata Hyuga. Orochimaru thought back on it. Ah, yes, the daughter of Hiyashi. I recall seeing her at a meeting once. She's quite young though, isn't she? I don't see Naruto dating a 12-year-old. Sasuke shook his head. No, you're thinking of Hanabi. Hinata's a member of Team 8. Orochimaru's face displayed revelation. Ah, yes, that makes a lot more sense. And so Sasuke and Orochimaru continued to talk, spending more time together. The master and apprentice bonding as friends, closer to family. Naruto, however, was off with Hinata on a little date, but none of the parties involved could have guessed what was occurring just outside of the village. Outside, the six paths of pain watched on. Tobi stood by his side, and on the other side of Tobi was Kisame Hoshigaki, eight elite shinobi each one dead set on taking what was theirs. Inside the village, there were two shinobi, both of whom possessed tailed beasts. They needed those two beasts and would not leave without them. Kisame, Animal Path, put your hands on my shoulder, Toby said. They did just that. Toby would then utilize his Kamui to get them inside of the village. There, Animal Path would summon the other paths of pain. Naruto was eating ice cream with Hinata. She licked the cold orb of fluffy, frozen flavor as she looked at Naruto. She felt her cheeks go flush as she saw him eating the ice cream with a smile on his face. 
The vendor was giving him the hardest, most angry stare one could imagine, as if Naruto's mere presence here was an affront to his business, let alone his eating of ice cream. Hinata noticed this, but she didn't say anything about it, despite the fact that it hurt her feelings. She didn't like to see people treat Naruto that way, but everyone they passed seemed to look at him with the same hatred. But why? She had never seen a reason why he should be so hated. It upset her so badly. Neither of them could have known that the residence where Gara was staying had been attacked, all staff there, every guard killed before they could raise an alarm. Gara had been taken, and his tailed beast had been removed. His body lay on the ground as pain stood above him. He didn't speak or say anything. He simply turned around and began to walk away. One target down, one target to go. Sasuke was walking down the streets of Konoha, his visit with Orochimaru having come to an end not long prior. Sakura caught up with him and was walking alongside him. She took his hand with a smile and they walked down the street together. Would you like to get something to eat? She asked him. He gave a slight nod of acceptance to which she led him to the nearest sushi bar. He always let her choose where to eat, it's not like it was a big deal to him. She enjoyed it, and he didn't really care what he ate so long as it wasn't poisonous. And sushi typically wasn't unless it was improperly prepared blowfish, which they did often eat. As they sat down to eat, the chef smiled and waited for their order. Once it was made, the two prepared to dig in. While Sasuke didn't really care what it was he ate, he did have preferences to flavors and could admit when something struck his fancy. One of these things being the white rice and the fish eggs on the side. This he loved, but what he loved even more was watching Sakura eat it. The face she made as the taste touched her tongue made Sasuke feel a subtle warmth shoot down his spine. Picking up a single piece of sushi with her chopsticks, she offered it to Sasuke who opened his mouth and ate it. The sushi chef tried to offer them privacy, turning away to clean some dishes, though those dishes had been previously cleaned. He merely offered the appearance of work to set the two at ease. Springtime was in Konoha and it meant that love was in the air. Young love was blooming, offering promises to the future. But a darkness blew over the village like the wind of death, and it carried with it the stench of terror and fear. As the sushi grew closer to Sasuke's face, it suddenly stopped moving. The look Sasuke and Sakura had previously held, the look of pure love had turned to dread as all of their hair stood on end. It was as if lightning was about to strike, causing their entire body to buzz with electromagnetic energy, despite there not being a cloud in the sky. Suddenly, they stood and rushed out, hoping to see something that wasn't there. Or was it there? Suddenly, a large explosion could be seen in the center of the village. Naruto had also seen this, as had Hinata. Naruto turned back to her. We're under attack! Begin getting the villagers to safety! What about you? She asked. Naruto looked back at her. I'm going to stop whoever's doing this. He then took off in the direction of the blast. He, Sasuke, and Sakura eventually met up, only to see six figures standing amidst the rubble and a seventh hovering in the air. Konoha Shinobi were already gathering around to fight. What's going on? Who is that? Sakura asked. Sasuke looked over at them. The Akatsuki. The same ones who took Gara? Naruto asked. Sasuke nodded. I can only guess what they're here for. Team 7 stepped out toward the Akatsuki. What are you doing here? Sasuke asked. Payne's diva path from his place hovering just above the building spoke. I'm here to take what is rightfully mine, the tailed beasts. Naruto scoffed. You think you have any right to them? Please. Diva looked at him. Peace in the world is within my grasp. All I need to do is reach out and take it. You hold one of the keys to ending war as a whole. Would you so selfishly keep it to yourself? Naruto shrugged. If it means keeping it away from unworthy people like you, yeah, I think I will keep it to myself. Pain seemed disappointed by this. He went to speak further, but Naruto cut him off. Let me stop you right there. I don't care what your ideology is, nor do I care to hear your excuses. What you're doing is wrong, and what you'll do later is likely very wrong. So even if it is selfish of me to hold onto this forever, that's gotta be better than giving it to you. Payne's mouth was left open, but then closed as he calmed himself a bit and returned to a softer expression. I was foolish for thinking you might understand. I suppose we have reached an impasse. It's time for us to put words aside and resort once more to violence, as that appears to be the only language you understand. And so they began to fight. Kisame came in towards Sasuke, swinging his blade, hoping that in making contact he might drain Sasuke of his chakra. But Sasuke dodged and pulled his own blade, coating it in lightning nature chakra. He and Kisame clashed, and slowly the lightning nature chakra was sapped from the blade, which led to Sasuke realizing what Kisame's blade could do. Getting struck by this blade would not only carve me up, but it'll also sap my chakra. Not a good idea. 
Sakura would then rush toward Animal Path, which would summon a centipede. She would dodge the centipede's first attack, vaulting onto its back and running up toward its head, where she put a massive fist down under the shell with enough force to cause the exoskeleton to crack. She kicked it to the side, causing it to pass out. Animal Path attempted to summon a Cerberus to do their bidding, but Sakura once more brought the pain. She would strike each of their heads by launching off a building at an angle. From her perch on the side of the building, she kicked off, flying so fast and so hard that she was able to strike all three heads at once. The creature let out a roar from each head and collapsed into a building. Sakura rose from that and focused on the animal path itself, striking as hard as she could. Naruto was rushing toward the diva path. He ran forward and then up the side of a building where he jumped from the roof up toward diva. Diva raised a hand and fired a Shinra Tensei down upon Naruto, knocking him back toward the building, where he would pass through. He would be jarred a bit, but when he gained his bearings about five seconds later, he attempted to stand up. Dusting off, he made his way back outside where he witnessed the diva path prepare another Shinra Tensei. This time around, however, he was ready for it. He activated Sage Mode and dodged to the side. The entire building where he had been standing was decimated. Naruto was left in awe of the power, but shook his head to get back in the game. The biggest issue was that this path was flying, and that every time he tried to get up to him, diva path would utilize its gravity manipulation to push him back down. Naruto needed to figure out a way to do this. He continued trying to probe its defenses, eventually learning that there had to be a cooldown for the ability, elsewise he would just spam it. That cooldown appeared to be about 5 seconds, and so Naruto began to shift his fighting style accordingly. He would find himself waiting for the perfect moment, and when that moment came, he would capitalize on it. He would rush up the side of a building and grab out at Diva's legs, pulling him down to ground level. Sasuke, all the while, was fighting against Kisame. Despite Sasuke's own blade work, Kisame was on a whole other level. And bearing one of the legendary Seven Swords of Kirigakure, his blade by comparison seemed flimsy and brittle. More often than not, when he was required to block an attack, he would coat himself in Susano armor. And though Susano would offer him protection, the armor was itself made of chakra, which meant that it could be absorbed by Samehara. This was an issue. It was then that Sasuke got an idea. He coated his blade in a Matarasu and controlled it with Kagatsuchi, which should be able to help him with the battle. His blade would meet with Samehara, and he found that the sentient blade refused to absorb a Matarasu. It didn't seem to like the taste. This was how Sasuke found Kisame's weakness. He would block attacks with his Susano, but this time coat it in a Matarasu and found that Samehara would not absorb the chakra. Sasuke, having found a massive hole in Kisame's abilities, decided to press the attack. He went on the offensive, his blade rushing through the air and slashing and stabbing motions with speed hard to keep track of. All the while, the flaming Susano around him also possessed blades, one in each of the arms it had. It began to rush Kisame. Kisame was a talented swordsman, but even he could admit that Sasuke's strategy was deadly effective. He needed to make room and escape. Doing a backflip, he prepared for a jutsu, but before he could launch it, he saw that Sasuke was rushing at him with a chidori. A chidori coated also with a matarasu. Kisame did the best he could and raised his blade to catch it, but to his horror, Sasuke's chidori passed clean through the samehara and through himself as well. Kisame coughed up blood. Sasuke pulled his hand back as the black flames that coated it were left in the wound, slowly spreading across Kisame's body. Sakura, on the other hand, had both Sage Mode and her Strength of 100 Seal active at the same time, which gave her strength a massive boost. But this could only last for so long. Sakura was not yet proficient enough in Sage Mode, and the toll it took on her body made it hard to properly control. In fact, the toll was so heavy on her body that she was putting out steam, her skin a deep pink, as if she were opening one of the eight gates. The cost of the power was about the same as well. Each strike was as if she were breaking her bones, but thanks to Creation Rebirth, the wounds would heal almost simultaneously. This allowed her to take on as many of the paths of pain as were thrown at her. This display of strength was enough to startle Pain, who began to wonder how someone so strong as she could be in the village. Toby would swoop in from behind. At this point, Sakura's senses were so sharp that she didn't even need to see or hear him to know he was there. She would immediately turn around to punch him, only for her hand to go clean through. He would kick her in the ribs, which would knock her back. All he had to do was hold her off until she ran out of chakra, and it was certain that she soon would. This form was taxing on both the body and the soul. Naruto, on the other hand, had two Rasengan, one for each hand. He was attempting to strike Pain with one, but missed as Pain jumped back. Suddenly, Naruto formed a shadow clone that grabbed his own hand. He spun with it, transferring the Rasengan over. He launched the clone at Pain. It flew forward and struck him, causing an explosion of chakra that knocked away the clone and Pain. Pain raised his hand and fired chakra rods back at Naruto. Naruto pulled his kunai and began to knock them away. 
That was when Pain fired another Shinra Tensei at him, knocking him back against the wall. More rods were coming in. Naruto managed to block quite a few until his left arm was pinned to the wall by a rod. He cried out but saw more coming. He would knock those out of the way as well. He would then focus on freeing himself. He knew it would hurt, but he needed to unwedge the rod quickly. He began to press on it, wiggling it about within his wound. This brought tears to his eyes as he was sure that his arm was broken, but he managed to pull it out. He turned around to attack them and suddenly he noticed something. Sakura being held by a masked man. He held her by her throat. She wasn't even able to stand on her own. She was also bleeding and breathing heavily. Sakura, he cried out. The battle came to a halt as Sasuke also turned to see her. Easy now, Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails. Toby said with the voice of Madara, it would be unwise to resist further. One of the paths of pain, the Naraka path, looked to Sasuke and demanded that he drop his weapon. Sasuke had no choice but to comply. Naruto gripped his broken arm and stepped forward. Please, don't hurt her. Whether we hurt her or not is up to you, Toby said. We only want one thing from you, the Nine Tails, Pain told him. If you give it to us, we will not harm this village nor its people any further. Naruto stood there, catching his breath. Sasuke called to Naruto. They're lying. Don't believe them. Naruto looked to Sasuke, and then to Sakura, who had one eye open looking at him. Naruto looked around the village. Do I have your word? Pain stepped forward and offered his hand. You have my word. Naruto stepped forward and took his hand. Diva then pressed his hand to Naruto's stomach and twisted the seal. The dark markings seemed to open up into a pitch black hole from which dark, oily substances began to ooze out. Naruto felt his legs buckle as the hand was pushed in deeper. He hit his knees as the black substance was now dripping out of his mouth. Stop it! Naruto! Sakura cried out as she resisted, only for her voice to be cut off by the tightening of Toby's grip. Sasuke tried to rush forward. Amaterasu, he commanded, a black flame shooting from his eye. Before it could hit pain though, the human path stepped in the way and took it. The Preta path then tackled Sasuke to the ground. Pain gripped onto something strong and began to pull. Suddenly, the chakra of the Nine Tails was pulled out. Naruto sat on his knees, his body shivering, his face pale and covered in sweat. Suddenly, his eyes rolled up into the back of his head as he let out a gasp and fell onto his back. Pain stepped away. We have what we came for, Pain said. He walked to Toby. Let's go. Toby pushed Sakura away. The six paths of Pain converged on Toby. Suddenly, Toby utilized Kamui and they teleported out. Sasuke stumbled to his feet and walked towards Sakura, who was crawling up on her knees. She had expended so much of her chakra that she couldn't even walk. Sasuke gripped her arm and lifted her. They saw Naruto laying there and came to his side. They managed to lift Naruto a little. He was shivering and sweating. His eyes couldn't hold focus on anything he looked at. It is Sakura safe? She took his hand. I'm here. It was at this time that Jiraiya and Tsunade appeared. Tsunade rushed over to Naruto to check on him. She looked at the open seal, the ink mixed with blood that was pouring out. She took a cloth that she had and pressed down against it. We need to get him to the ER. Sakura looked up. His beast. Tsunade looked at her. It's better than leaving him here. And so with Jiraiya's help, they lifted Naruto up. They began moving him to the hospital's ER where Tsunade was already scrubbing up. Sakura was hoping to help, but Tsunade stopped her. Sakura, stop. But Lady Tsunade, I have to help. Tsunade sat Sakura down in a chair, whether Sakura wanted to or not. No. You're too close to this. Your emotions are out of control and that'll make you sloppy. Besides, you can hardly stand on your own. Do you think you're in any position to heal? You may be talented, but don't forget who taught you. Trust I'll do my best. She nodded. Tsunade rushed off to help Naruto. Jiraiya paced the hall, doing a single lap before taking a seat. Sakura was sitting in the chair opposite him. Sasuke was kneeling down next to her. It's my fault, she said. If I hadn't been reckless with my chakra, I wouldn't have gotten captured and Naruto wouldn't have had to do that. Suddenly, Hinata rushed in. Where's Naruto? Sasuke looked over. How did you... She looked at him. I heard them talking downstairs while I was escorting civilians. They said he got hurt. What happened? Jiraiya ran his fingers through his silver hair. He had the nine tails pulled out of him. Hinata's eyes widen as tears begin to overflow. Please, tell me he can be saved. Tsunade's in there with him now, Sasuke said. All we can do is pray for the best. Some time would pass. It couldn't have been more than a couple hours, though it felt like days. Tsunade walked out. Hinata stood. Naruto, is he... Tsunade took a deep breath. When it comes to the loss of a tailed beast, the Jinchuriki generally perishes because of a loss of chakra. Their bodies become dependent upon the beast. When it's removed, it's almost like ripping out a vital organ. I thought that maybe if I gave him an over-infusion of chakra that I might be able to save him. And? Sasuke asked. Sakura looked at Tsunade. Did you save him? Tsunade cleared her throat. The infusion, he... 
took for about an hour. It extended the time he could go without the beast. Tsunade could see the tears forming already. She tried to finish what she was saying, despite the fact that she was also beginning to break down. It couldn't replace the beast, and Naruto succumbed to his injuries. Hinata fell to her knees. She didn't cry, no. Her eyes dripped tears indeed, but she didn't wail or show further emotion. She simply stared off as though Tsunade wasn't standing there. Sakura broke down into tears, and Sasuke seemed to be having an issue deciding where to put his emotions, whether he should cry or lash out. Should he blame Pain, Tsunade, Naruto, or himself? Jiraiya lay his head back against the wall as his hands raised to his forehead. Tsunade shook her head. There was nothing I could do. That could be done in general. I did everything one could do, she said, as if she were trying to convince herself. After some time passed, they were allowed to see Naruto. His pale body laid face up on a slab of metal. A sheet over top him, pulled down just enough so his face was exposed. It looked frozen in time. The last thing he felt being forever expressed upon his face. He looked tired, like he had indeed been fighting a losing battle. Hinata at this moment began to break down, her voice letting out a cry that Sasuke had never heard before, hoped to never hear again. She held him close, stroking his hair as if somehow that might wake him up. She begged, pleaded. She cried out for God to give her one miracle to save his life, but Naruto remained as cold to the touch as he previously was. They took their time to grieve. The sight of him like that burned into their memories. But worse still than seeing he was gone was seeing the reaction of the villagers. To them, it was as if nothing had changed, or worse, that a weight had been lifted from their shoulders. After all, they didn't have to worry about that demon fox anymore. All but those who truly knew Naruto were apathetic to the passing of this young life. Teuchi was one of those who cared, who cared a lot. Sasuke remembered breaking the news to him. Having ordered a bowl out of kindness despite his lack of desire to eat, he told him. Teuchi seemed like he was taking it well until he accidentally dropped the pot that contained his world-famous ramen. Sasuke would jump over the side of the counter to ensure he was okay, only to see him crying. When Naruto had nobody, he had Teuchi and there had always been a reason for that. Teuchi had taken it upon himself to be a figure Naruto could look up to and provide him with the one thing Naruto couldn't feel from anyone else, the very ingredient that made his ramen taste as good as it did. Genuine love. And now that Naruto was gone, the ramen tasted different. It could never taste the same. And life moved on. That's what it always did. It didn't slow down for anyone to breathe, it just kept going. Tsunade attempted to give Team 7 time to grieve, but she was not afforded the same. A summit was being called over the threat of the Akatsuki, and she had to attend. Sasuke, at this point, was playing the role of comforter. He knew what it was like to lose someone you loved. His Mangekyo Sharingan was proof of that. He tended to Hinata, who would not eat, would not speak, would not leave her room. It was as if she died too. This pain was enough that Sasuke could feel it, and if the Byakugan could evolve through pain as well, surely she would have a Mangekyo Byakugan by now. Sasuke felt as if his Sharingan might develop further. The pain was immense. Sakura blamed herself for this and couldn't stop. Sasuke tried to break her out of it, but she was adamant that she made a bad decision and it was eating her up. Sasuke told her that there was no changing the past, but only the future, and that they would find Naruto's murderers and avenge him. After all, that's all Sasuke could ever think to do with his sorrow when someone he loved died. Figure out who to blame and hate them to death. And right now, he refused to blame Sakura. He went to Jiraiya to speak with him. He found Jiraiya in the park, by a tree, sitting there eating a popsicle. There was a second one melting in his hand. Sasuke sat down. Your popsicle's melting. Jiraiya didn't even look at Sasuke. Have you ever poured one out for the dead? That's what I'm doing here. I'm wasting half of this popsicle because this half, even if he isn't here, it's still Naruto's and I'm not going to eat it. Jiraiya was taking it hard. He wasn't crying, but it was obvious that he had been. His eyes were puffy and red and his lips were stained blue. Sasuke noticed how many popsicle sticks were laying beside him. He must have been pouring them out a lot for Naruto. You know, Jiraiya said as he ate his popsicle, I wasn't there when I should have been. Sasuke shook his head. You got there as fast as you could, it's not your fault. Jiraiya shook his head. I'm not talking about Naruto. I mean, the one who attacked you. Pain. I trained him. Sasuke seemed shocked by this. Jiraiya continued. He was an orphan from Amegakure. I found him and his friends during the Second Shinobi World War. I protected him, raised him, and trained him before I left back for Konoha. I had heard he had been killed. I 
didn't know. If I had known... Jiraiya stopped. Pain is the leader of the Akatsuki. I trained the leader of the Akatsuki. I created them. I did this. Sasuke held out his hand to stop Jiraiya. No, you did your best. You can't feel responsible. You did your best to train them how and when to use their abilities. They made the decision to hurt people with them. And if you hadn't trained them, someone else would have, and they still would have ended up this way. There's nothing you could have done. Jiraiya looked at him. There's nothing, huh? What about if I stayed in Ame? Then it hit Sasuke. Wait, say that again. Say what? What about if I had stayed in Ame? Sasuke pointed to him. I got it. Payne stood there and looked at the demonic statue of the Outer Path. With the demise of Killer B, the Eight Tails had been taken, and now they had them all. They were in the process of sealing them up, with the Nine Tails being the last one in. Payne stood there and spoke as Toby stood propped against the wall. And now that the demonic statue of the Outer Path is complete, I may use it to bring peace. It was then that a shinobi rushed in. Lord Payne, we're surrounded! Payne looked back. Surrounded? By who? The shinobi gulped. Everyone! Payne stepped out to take a look and noticed all five of the great shinobi villages encamped around them. Konoha, Suna, Kiri, Iwa, and Kumo. All five were beating the doors down, trying to get inside. Payne turned back to his six paths. Distract them. I will have the beast awakened and absorb it into myself. The six paths then jumped down into the crowd below to face them as Diva walked back into the room with the ghetto statue. Slowly, from another room, the heavily crippled body of Nagato came riding out on a mechanical walker. By his side was Conan. Diva waited there for him. Nagato waited in front of the statue. The beast was finally absorbed, which awakened it into the form of the Tentails. This surprised Nagato by the ferocious nature of the beast, and from there, Diva and Conan began making ready to seal it into Nagato. They kept it busy. Suddenly, Six Paths Ten Tails Coffin Seal was cast, and the beast was absorbed. But to Conan's horror, it wasn't Nagato who was sealing it up. Instead, it was Toby who stood above the dead body of Nagato. Diva Path collapsed thereafter. Nagato's left eye socket was empty, and Toby by this time ditched his mask and applied the Rinnegan. He absorbed the Ten Tails. Conan shuddered at the sight. She knew for certain she would not survive this. Outside, the Six Paths of Pain and the forces of Ame were fighting against the allied shinobi forces, and suddenly the Six Paths of Pain collapsed. There was confusion on both sides, when suddenly from the building behind, a bright ray of light shot up into the sky, and coming from that light was Obito, the Ten Tails Jinjuriki. From the shadows, Black Zetsu watched. He slowly began sneaking up on Obito. Obito turned and stabbed into Black Zetsu. And you think I've forgotten about you, vestige of Madara's will? No, this plan is something I have worked towards. I will not have Madara take credit, nor will I have him ruin my plans. He would go about eradicating Zetsu with his fire release. With that loose end out of the way, Obito then turned toward the group. You would be wise to stop resisting. Surrender now and I will free you from your troubles. Sasuke, however, ignored the warning and rushed forward. Seeing this, Sakura would follow. They would race up the building and attempt to strike out at Obito. Sakura would activate both her Sage Mode and her Strength of 100 Seal. Her muscles bulged a bit as steam began to pour off her. Doing so, she struck out at Obito. Her strike was enough to snap his staff in half. She knocked him into the ground, where she would kick off the surface of the air and launch herself down at him, punching into him as he lay on the ground. Sasuke would form his Susano from the top of the building and launch an arrow down at Obito from there. The arrow would strike the ground, missing him. Obito would bend back to avoid it. Sakura could see the way he was bent and would jump into the air and drop kick him in the hips, causing him to straighten out and smack his head on the arrow's shaft before falling back. Sakura stood, as did Obito. Obito seemed to heal rather quickly. He formed another staff from one of his Truth Seeker orbs. He would straighten his posture with a smile. Is that all you can do to me? She grunted. She noticed that one of the strands of her hair that had been before her face had turned white. Her hair was starting to turn white from overuse of her technique. All the same, she had to stop this man no matter what. She poured as much power as she could into her next attacks. She rushed at him again, smacking the ground so hard that a pillar of stone came out to strike him. He was struck in the face, and while flying back, Sakura ran and jumped from that pillar and gripped him, where she would spin in a circle and throw him at Sasuke, who was himself using his curse mark, having realized that his jutsu can be absorbed without it. His Susano stabbed out at Obito and knocked him into the ground. Obito was slow to stand up. Sasuke landed beside Sakura. He looked to her and noticed that her hair was all but white now, her eyes sunken into her head. Her skin was losing elasticity. Are you okay? He asked. She smiled. Let's just finish this. 
And so they went back to attacking Obito, Sakura being the spearhead due to her insane power-up. But as they were pushing Obito back, Sakura's breathing increased. Sakura, step back. You're going to kill yourself, Sasuke said. Sakura shook her head. No, I'm going to see this through. Sasuke looked to her. Do you even have any chakra left? She nodded. A little. And if I have to, I'll supplement it with more sage energy. Sasuke shook his head. No, if you'll do that, you'll turn to stone. Sakura looked back at him. I'm doing my duty. You can't do this without me, so just get ready. This has to be the last attack. Make it count. Sasuke nodded. They rushed forward, their chakra flaring. Sakura added all of her strength as Sasuke did the same, coating their fists in Susano armor and Amaterasu. They struck Obito so hard that it parted the clouds behind them and caused it to stop raining. Their hands were within him. They gripped the tailed beasts and began to pull. Sakura pulled as hard as she could and together with Sasuke managed to pull them out. Obito fell back. Sasuke huffed and puffed. We did it. He then noticed Sakura falling over. He caught her. Looking down at her in his arms, he noticed how frail and old she now appeared. Her hair was white and her skin was covered in wrinkles. That's it. I'm burned out. He shook his head. No, we were going to get married. You can't. She smiled. I will always love you, Sasuke. Her body began turning to stone from her overusage of Senjutsu. Sasuke nodded. I'll always love you too. She laughed. Your dream, Sasuke. Don't deny yourself for me. I love you too much to let you deny yourself your dream. Sasuke was beginning to cry. I wanted it to be you. She wiped his tears away. I simply wasn't your destiny. If I had been, we would have ended up together. She said as she took a heavy breath. Sasuke leaned down and kissed her. He extended the moment as long as he could until he felt her lips turn to stone. He couldn't bring himself to stop, couldn't bring himself to open his eyes and admit it was over. But it was, and he had to understand that. Opening his eyes, he lay her down, the most beautiful statue he had ever seen or ever would see. He then stood and walked to Obito. Obito looked up at him. See, love doesn't last. Love dies. You open your heart for a moment and you're sure to be hurt by it. Sasuke looked down at him. What was her name? Obito was confused. Sasuke asked the question again. Obito thought for a moment. It was Rin. Rin Nohara. Sasuke knelt down next to him. I hate you. So much. I want you to die, but... Most of all, right now, I want Sakura back. Obito scoffed. I would have cast the infinite Tsukiyomi. I could have put you in a world where anything was possible, where you could have anything. No loss, no death, nothing. Sasuke shook his head. But it wouldn't have had Sakura. Not my Sakura. Why did you have to take her away from me? Why couldn't you let me be happy? Obito was confused. I was going to make you happy. Sasuke hiccuped through his tears. Happy? In a dream world with a fake Sakura? I would have never been happy. I would have resented it and I'm not the only one. Obito was surprised. S so you're saying you would rather be happy for only a little while and suffer rather than live in a dream where everything is perfect? Sasuke nodded. Yeah, because this world isn't a dream. The people here are real and I love them. I would have lost them forever if you had your way. Obito thought about it. He had made a horrible mistake. One he had to make right. Two years later, Sasuke stood there, looking up at the Hokage Rock to see his own face staring back at him. After the fourth Shinobi World War, Tsunade had felt it best to pass the role of Hokage down to Orochimaru's former pupil. Sasuke had proven himself a hundred times over, and all the same, she wanted to break a few records. First of all, Sasuke was not only the first Uchiha Hokage in Konoha history, but he was also the youngest. And today was a special day. Sasuke turned around and saw Sakura standing there in a beautiful white kimono. Sasuke himself was standing in a black one. Walking with Sakura was Hinata. Sasuke smiled. He thought back on the miraculous nature of this union. Two years prior, he had no idea that the Rinnegan had the power to revive the dead. Perhaps he had misjudged Tobi. Obito was merely a broken man who had lost his love and found it replaced by hatred. Sasuke could have so easily ended up like that. But in the last moments of his life, in a way of apologizing for his mistakes, Obito had undone the damage caused to them, and Sakura had been returned to life in a condition far better than she had been at death. This caused Sasuke to smile. Suddenly, an arm wrapped around his shoulder. You ready to get hitched? Naruto asked with a laugh. Sasuke laughed too. Yes. Naruto too had been revived by Obito. Everyone, since the village was attacked, had been revived. It seemed that things might finally turn for the better. Sakura stepped up before Sasuke and both looked toward Orochimaru. 
Shall we begin? And this is where I'm gonna call it quits. Honestly, I had a heck of a fun time writing this one. I hope you enjoyed it too. The power of love conquers all, am I right? I guess it also goes the other way, because if it hadn't been for Rin's death, Obito wouldn't have done the evil things he had. I mean, wow. Obito, I know you were upset, my guy, but you killed countless people. If you look up the word simp in the dictionary, it just shows a picture of Obito. Anyway, I tried to make Sakura more important in this story because I don't think she gets due credit for her potential sometimes. I hope I did her some justice here. So tell me, what did you think of the story? Did you like it? If so, let me know in the comments what you thought. Was there anything you would have done differently? Anything you would have preferred? We love getting your ideas and requests. Until next time, peace out. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi. And make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.